everyone to to our council meeting um, firstly any apologies uh, mr mayor 10 to 2 and I, hopefully all, all plan will be back by 20 past 2. okay any further apologies apart from that which is noted by council brian thank you for the advising you move that the apology so council the duty is going to move that seconded by Councillor Williams for that brief apology for Councillor Bryan. All those in favour, aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Under conflicts of interest, just, just um, want to advise that in the public, uh, today we are considering a paper on the publicly excluded by WOW Trust. It's the pre-feasibility study update. Um, for the purposes of openness and transparency, I would like to disclose that last year when the Well Trust was seeking crowdfunding for the Kaipoi Water Park proposal, I made a personal donation of $50 as I wanted to see the pre-feasibility work undertaken. And I just want to put that on the public record. Yes, sorry. Count, sorry. And me too. <laughs> Yes, yes, I made a donation also. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I made a donation also to the pre feasibility study only. We come to acknowledgements. And firstly, I'd just like to recognise those who were successful with Queen's birthday, birthday honours at the weekend. Um, Araha Rarity Crofts, um, now Dame Araha, uh, was made a Dame Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Among a long list of achievements, Araha is known to us all as Council's Kamatua. Lintiaka was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to Māori education. David Carrera was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to mountaineering and outdoor recreation. And Christopher Marshall of Ahoka was made a QSM uh, for services uh, to music. It's fantastic that four members of our community have been recognized for outstanding public service. We are very proud of all of them for what they do, and for those that aren't recognised, actually. But uh, this year, uh, it's very special, particularly um, uh, Dame Maraha. That was magnificent for her to make that achievement. Um, I will, uh, on behalf of the council, I will write to each of those who've received and pass on our congratulations. But I just wish to acknowledge those here today. Right. Any other acknowledgements? So we come to confirmation of minutes, item 4.1, minutes of the meeting uh, held on the 5th of May, pages 12 to 25. Do I have a, someone prepared to move? Moved by Councillor Atkinson, seconded by Councillor Barnett. Any discussion? All those in favour, aye. aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Item 4.2, minutes of the PX, we'll deal with those in um, publicly excluded section. Any matters arising? Uh, deputations and presentations, I haven't been advised of any. We come now to adjourned business. Uh, first is item 6.1, and that's Sophie Allen, who I understand is going to join us. Adrian, is that correct? So just wait a couple of minutes while that gets set up. Is she going to be on the screen or? 
Oh, I'm, this is Sophie here, I'm present. Hi, Sophie, welcome to our meeting. We can't hear you yet, so I'll just, I'll clip off my uh, microphone and see if that makes a difference. Are you able to hear me now? You're on mute there, Sophie, so to us anyway. Are you able to hear me now? Mm. Are you able to hear me now? is um, 7.1 COVID related reports pages 38 to 49 Mr Palmer sorry thank you Mr Mayor this report is a assessment of the COVID situation as we understand it today uh, we've attempted to uh, develop a risk register that identifies the particular COVID risks that we intend tracking and monitoring. And so today that's for your uh, consideration and we'd welcome any feedback on your views as to our assessment of that risk and um, how we're managing that. I've, while there are, there are a number of risks related to, to the COVID virus as it impacts our council and this assessment is a council only assessment. The key issues that we are concerned about initially from a health and safety point of view and thankfully I just see that we've now had our 11th day with uh, no new cases which is uh, great news uh, for us all. While health and safety was the particular concern initially, uh, with that now seeming to be not the, the key issue, certainly the economic impact of this is something which we are still uh, concerned about and see that that has both some potentially significant impacts for both the council and our district. As I've signalled earlier, I think there are many other uh, parts of the country and the world for that matter that will fare worse than Waimakariri um, because of the particular characteristics that Waimakariri have or the features of Waimakariri but nonetheless there is likely to be an impact and I suspect that uh, while we're at level two and may go to level one soon awaiting the government's advice on that um, that may lessen the immediate impact I think my concern more is with the broader global economic impact 
and what that may do subsequently to the New Zealand economy. So we're watching that particularly closely. And at a council level, um, over the next several months in particular, we'll be closely monitoring the impact on our business, uh, demand for our services, our consenting services for building consent and resource consent, uh, which has a significant impact on our activity, as well as some other uh, types of business like our Learn to Swim schools, which currently we're only partially operating through level two, um, just seeing what the uh, return of business is there. While it's been promising initially, uh, we will need to keep monitoring that on an ongoing basis. So that is certainly what we perceive as being our most significant risk at this time. There are a number of others which um, you'll have seen in the assessment that we've that we've looked at and uh, through our various mitigation actions taken, uh, managed those risks to what we think is a reasonably low or manageable level. Um, I would be happy to take any questions or feedback that you might have in regard to the report. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Any questions? Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I note on page, um, first page of your report, um, the six, oh, hang on. Um, the six cases in Canterbury, active cases at the time of writing. Uh, do we have any update on that? I, um, you, you indicated you'd just heard that we were 11th day um, with no new cases. I, last I heard there was one active case in the country. Is that still active? And is it, do we know whether it's local? I haven't checked what the update is today in that regard, but there is, um, the last advice was that there is one active case in New Zealand and that's, a, that's uh, associated with a cluster in Auckland. Uh, so there are, there are no cases that I'm aware of in Canterbury. It's, it's interesting just to see how, how fast the world picture is uh, changing. Though at the time um, we drafted this report, there were five, nearly 5 million cases. Well, we're now at 6.3, 6.4 million and um, uh, considerably more deaths than the 315 that are noted here. But um, yeah, it has certainly changed quickly in New Zealand, um, I dare say, for the good. Long may that can. Any further questions? Councillor Doody. Thank you. Um, just a query, please, for us with our other associated meetings. Uh, do you do you think we'd be still be doing them by Zoom or actually physically in here? It's like our committee meetings and our, perhaps our um, community board meetings, different things like that. Uh, very much looking to do them in person. Um, and I think uh, next week's meeting, well, there's an Oxford Community Board meeting tomorrow night, which is happening in person uh, here, I believe. Um, but yeah, the intent is to, to hold all those meetings in person. Um, yes, very much so. Any further questions? So we have a, series, a recommendation there. Someone prepared to move. Moved to Councillor Doody, seconded. Councillor um, Redmond, any discussion? Councillor Doody. Thank you very much for that report. It was um, very well written and um, it's given us a great deal of food for thought as to just how lucky we are in our situation here at present. So long may that last. Councillor Redmond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There is still one active case in the country, in the North Island. So we are very lucky in the South Island. And there's a strong likelihood we'll be moving to level one next week. So I guess Mr. Palmer will need to assess the implications of that again as we go through these various levels. So thank you very much for a comprehensive report. Thank you, any further speakers? Right of reply, Councillor Doody. So I'll put the, put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare that carried. So 
Are we in a position to come back to 6.1, do you think, or would you like a bit more time? A little more time? That's, yes. Okay, all right. Well, we can come back to that um, before we, a little later anyway, and if need be, we'll deal with it. So. Thank you. Thanks, Yemi. Next. Next. The next item is 7.2, which is the COVID recovery plan, and that's a report in the name of um, Simon Hart, pages 50 to 68. Uh, Mr. Hart, thank you. Welcome to our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, councillors. Uh, Simon Markham will be joining us very shortly. He's just been caught up with something. Um, so the, the purpose of this report is to formally seek council support to lead the development and, and implementation of a district recovery plan in conjunction with our community partners. We're doing this under the brand Better Than Before, acknowledging that this is a great place to live and work, but we can come out of this event a lot stronger. Uh, as we have learned from the earthquake, recovery process. Uh, recovery is about building the plane as we fly it. And uh, you'll note that there are already a number of national programs and local programs that are underway uh, as, as we continue to build this, this recovery plan. But with the event still unfolding and us yet to know what that final event um, damage or impact will look like, now's a really important time for us to progress the development of this recovery plan for the district and to, to move that process forward. Now, this report uh, notes that it is important for us to stay open to changes, um, but we still need to confirm a structure and a process to go forward with this recovery. And so that is uh, a recommendation in front of you today. The report also discusses the early benefits of wider community uh, consultation and engagement. Uh, we already have some really good existing social service sector networks and uh, we would like to um, discuss with you the establishment of an economic recovery advisory group to help better inform us and provide us with economic insights as we go into this recovery with both an economic and a social feel to it. I'll take the report as read but I will just highlight a few things from the report as we go through. Uh, you'll note that uh, this event is unprecedented in nature in our lifetime. It emerged out of China in December in 2019, and since that time to the end of May, more than 5 million confirmed cases have been recorded across 188 countries with sadly almost 325,000 deaths. New Zealand's response has been considered to be very, very good, and that is uh, highlighted on page 52 graph, uh, which shows us shows China the origin of the event, and then it shows the US who's tracking quite high, of course. Today, there is only one confirmed case of COVID in New Zealand, which is, is you know, quite remarkable from a public health perspective. However, the impact of this will be quite significant, and we note the unprecedented debt destruction, accumulation of likely debt, and job losses in New Zealand. And this in turn will have a significant psychosocial community uh, impact as well. At a national level, Treasury projections are suggesting that real GDP will decline from about 2.8% at the end of 2019 to around minus 5% in 2020. And over the same period of time, unemployment will go from around 4% to more likely 10%. Um, and some econom uh, economists uh, across the country are suggesting that these, these are quite conservative figures. Uh, either way, continuing to assess how this uh, particular pandemic will affect our district is really, really important. And we need to assess as we go on how we can best mobilise the available resources that we have to address the issues here in our district uh, through this recovery planning process. And we need to note that this is probably more likely to be a marathon in nature rather than a sprint. It's a two to five year kind of time frame that we're, we're looking at. On your page 53, you'll note that we've included a diagram which describes some of the economic blockages that are occurring across the world and here in New Zealand. 
And then further down, in terms of GDP and unemployment rate, on page 54, you, we've highlighted the significance of the COVID event. In GDP terms, we've, we've highlighted that in that first graph compared with the global financial crisis of 2009-2010. And then the second graph, we highlight the steep incline in unemployment uh, compared with previous periods. Locally, we've done some initial assessments, both from an economic and a social recovery perspective. Uh, ENC and Enterprise North Canterbury have undertaken around 705 business assessments. That's more than double what they would normally do in a year, uh, a year. And, and that 705 was undertaken in a two month period. So it sort of indicates the increase in business anxiety, if you like. Uh, and, and at the same time, registered job seekers uh, with the Ministry of Social Development has increased from around 550 to over 1,200 in this district. So we are starting to see the impact of this occur. And I would note that those numbers uh, are occurring at the same time as we Gerald, still it's have Tia, how are you? Jared. immediate response packages. Such I'm as, having uh, one um, of my salary, usual council days. Uh, um, and so on in place. I can't get Sophie sound to work. It think uh, that you guys think uh, it must be something has, on her um, side. has produced a psychosocial and exactly mental well-being plan. Week, You'll note uh, well. that the, the Is there uh, any I that is Can you do report 6.1? And I just... From that, I'll just note that they they highlight that from a psychosocial and community perspective, I'm just, uh, these sorts of events have a bigger impact on some parts of our community than on other parts. And, and those that have higher risk are those who are at higher risk of contracting COVID, of course, people with pre-existing health issues. Yeah, but uh, I'm just scared that Sophie won't be able actually to hardship, zoom in for the last one as well. People who have lost their job or their household this income. This is my major time. concern. Uh, people who have had cultural or religious values or customs interrupted, and children and young people uh, over the longer longer term period. Uh, under section four of this report also, uh, we just note the unprecedented yeah. legislative and uh, fiscal. Um, that had that had been that resolved. Government yeah. has put in place in the immediate term. And it was working perfectly. And, and then, we just but note that that's likely I can to hear her. And be uh, but with the guys, the councillors can't hear her in the council recovery chamber. Recovery packages at a national level. Locally, it's um, our initial recovery planning has begun, and you've seen through briefings the six programs we've put together with the 27 projects. This is our long list, of course, of potential projects. Uh, we would like to do some more um, consultation with some key stakeholders in our community, and of course, further conversations with council to refine that list into a more concise list for a final recovery plan. Uh, and we think that it's important as part of that to follow the principles noted in 4.5. Towards the end of section four on page 57, you'll see a couple of images we thought were pretty good. The first one from Ariana Huffington, which I think nicely reflects the better than before. Uh, slogan that we're pushing with this um, recovery planning process. And the second one, uh, some key considerations we think really important to keep in the back of our mind as we go forward and continue this planning process. Then at 4.10 and 4.11, uh, we just talk about uh, the um, uh, economic recovery advisory group that we have uh, proposed. Uh, there's a terms of reference for that and the attachments, of course and uh, just seeking council's approval to have the chief executive and mayor start to have some initial conversations with leaders within the relative sectors that might be involved in that group. And finally, under section five, the financial implications section, just noting that of course, uh, any final recovery plan would need to uh, have consideration of funding um, once we have confirmed what programs and projects may eventually end up in that program. But of course, in the interim, uh, there is a sum of um, a provisional sum of half a million dollars in the annual plan for a two year period to get us started on this journey of recovery planning and uh, uh, delivery. Uh, Simon, if there's any other notes you'd like to make, otherwise, uh, very happy to take any questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Any questions? Councillor Blakey, followed by Councillor Barnett. Thank you. Uh, Simon, um, page 55, 3.17, that um, cultural and religious values interrupted and impacting, um, and, and especially the funeral thing. In what way do you think council can be involved in, in, in I mean, 
bearing in mind it's been and gone, in what way do you think we can be involved in remedying that that type of situation, bearing in mind that those groups, although they were they were very inconvenienced, they're they're, they're well established, um, you know, um, in their in, the, in their own right. Uh, yes, it's a it's a really good observation, um, <clears throat> and I think as you as you mentioned, uh, as the uh, restriction levels ease, those interruptions are also reduced, and we're starting to see a greater allowance for uh, religious and cultural uh, customs and practices um, uh, back within our community. My hope is that that will continue as the restrictions ease, but certainly our, our community team, led by uh, Tessa Sturley. Um, have some really strong networks in the social service sector and I think they're doing some excellent work establishing what uh, the uh, the precise issues that we might need to address through a recovery plan and um, and and thinking about how we might do that. Councillor Barnett. Yes, thank you, Simon. Just two questions from me. First of all, we learned from the earthquake that it was good to take the community with us quite early and get their input. How are you looking to involve elected members and the wider community um, in the early stages of this recovery plan? Uh, first note would be um, we're, we're putting together in a, a community consultation and engagement plan, I think. Uh, that needs to be a little further detailed, but that's the beginning of us putting together what the journey with the council and our community might look like. Certainly the, the formation of the Economic uh, Recovery Advisory Group and the significant network that exists within our social services sector and our community team will really help to uh, provide us with a basis of that consultation and conversation. Certainly uh, also our next steps will include a series of uh, meetings and further conversations with council. Uh, and, and our engagements, of course, will certainly consider how councillors can be involved. Uh, any further comment on that, Simon? Yeah. And of course, community boards as well. Yes, thank you. Um, the second question was, obviously, uh, central government's going to be doing a whole lot of recovery initiatives going forward. How will we avoid duplication and how will we coordinate with them? Cool. So it's a very good question because there is certainly a lot amount of central government funding uh, being allocated. Uh, we are, are uh, seeking to inventory what actually is available to us in, in into this district, so that uh, as you um, uh, as we further develop the program of projects, we are and, and any decisions that you might be making about funding are conscious of what central government's putting on the table. Uh, so that's a piece of work that uh, we hope we can come bring back to you in July council. Uh, and literally almost, almost by the day, um, additional funds are being um, allocated. So it is, it is continuing to move. But we had that comment with um, the uh, regional manager of uh, MSD that uh, there, in, in, as part of our core recovery group meeting a week or so back, that um, there, are, there are a range of initiatives across different government agencies. And of course, we sort of sit here looking up and expect them to be all self-aware of what each arm of government are doing, and that at times is not quite the case. So we, we're actually in quite a good position to put that picture together, although um, it, it would be helpful if that was already um, uh, available to councils up and down the country as well. Councillor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions that follow on really from Councillor Barnett, which is the time, I mean, this is a, a massive <laughs> document to work through this report. Uh, the time frame for getting the plan operational, um, how speedy are you going to be in getting all this uh, together? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so um, following this uh, report, we hope to go out, uh, have initial conversations with the Economic Recovery Advisory Group uh, potential members, start to uh, do some initial consultation and engagement around our 27 
projects, six programs, which is the long list, start to get some feedback on that so that we can bring back some more conf uh, informed conversation uh, with council. Looking to July to, to put in front of council um, a very early draft of a recovery plan, um, which would include a refined list of those programs and projects. Uh, and as Simon said, uh, considers also some of the funding streams, both centrally and then what's left over. Uh, and so, so July would be a key date for us. And then following that confirmation of, of a plan and then implementation. But as I say, we, we, we have been flying the plane as it's being built. So there are already recovery actions underway, both nationally and locally. One other question. Um, I'm aware that um, this council is um, has a, applied in conjunction with ECAN in Christchurch City for um, environmental type projects that ECAN is um, uh, coordinating. Um, where in your this document and your list of projects does that fit? Because it didn't immediately strike me where it fitted. Uh, it's a good question, and uh, it there are two areas. Oh, two possible projects it fits under it, it it can be grouped with councils what it's doing in accelerating its capital program how we're leveraging the shovel ready um, projects um, and and undoubtedly those, those sort of funds are going to be seeking partnership funding with councils it's not all uh, unless we are optimistically mistaken uh, it's not all going to be money that shoveled out of Wellington uh, so we will need to consider how to balance uh, what is um, uh, co-investment by the government with what is reasonable and appropriate locally. So it fits in that area. I think also it fits a little bit in the green economy project. And we've, we've, we've coined a project called green economy, which is how do we, using the royal we, leverage the recovery out of this disaster with some of the bigger picture sustainability, climate change kind of issues that council will be wrestling with in any event. Oh. Uh, and, and so uh, you, you're seeing in the national dialogue, particularly led out of the Climate Change Commission, uh, seeking for government to apply that lens in the way it allocates uh, shovel ready projects money how a Ministry for the Environment and Department of Conservation operate in terms of the funding that they would be administering out of green jobs and such like. So, it, it, and it's still frankly a little bit unclear what, you know, there's $1.1 billion allocated to a green jobs scheme, uh, anticipating 11,000 jobs being created out of it. I note that's $100,000 a job. Um, a job creation is expensive. Um, uh, but but beyond that, we uh, have have yet to see, and it's it's an observation, not a criticism, because it's it's moving pretty fast. Uh, but we've yet to see how that might be taken advantage of and appropriate in this district. Councillor Williams, followed by Councillor Duty. Thank you. I can see the problems we're going to have with um, a wee bit of the social um, climate and to me I think it's our duty to be forwarding onto these social agencies that um, support um, people around. Um, the next biggest thing is going to be the financial help that businesses are going to need and um, the, it is, yeah, the rut that the um, um, the people are going to get into how how on this project are we actually going to help that going forward without causing us uh, spending a lot of money and making a big bureaucratic nightmare and actually causing rates to increase while trying to help um, some of these businesses. Look, a couple of quick comments, and it's a big question. <laughs> uh, uh, on the one hand, look, there is practical advisory help that ENC has been securing for several weeks now and continues to do that. Uh, and, and it's an observation, not a criticism of that, but that is helping businesses determine whether they have a future or not. And, and, 
and we are genuinely all a bit uncertain as to how it's going to play out when the wage subsidy that's currently in train uh, ends and then the, the narrower subsidy for businesses that are suffering 50% or more downturn in revenue, how that plays out as well. So it will be a watch and wait and see how that goes, but um, uh, that's the practical on the ground assistance that is, I'll say, affordable through the Enterprise North Canterbury um, uh, contract, if you like, that they have with the, the council. And they've been pretty successful in leveraging other funding to do that, but that won't continue forever either. I think the other uh, question that this whole program will, or series of programs will raise is what's the right balance between restraint in the council's finances and budgeting and expansion? And I'll use an example. Uh, so um, an economist, uh, uh, Shamabil Jakob, says to us that if you took a million dollars of reduction in rates, that has a jobs equivalent, and this is a broad average, okay? So it's a very broad assessment. That, that might assist saving or generating about eight and a half jobs. If, if local authorities bore a, a million dollars in debt for their capital program, and for the Waimakariri District Council, a million dollars in debt would fund about $14 million in capital that has a jobs uh, outcome of about 155 jobs. Now, those assessments are extremely coarse. Of course, it's never, it's, it's the mythical average, but uh, that's, that's, that's about $90,000 a job. And as I mentioned earlier, there's about, you know, 11,000 jobs out of 1.1 billion in green jobs is about $100,000 in jobs. So it's really expensive to create jobs. Um, but that, that is, a, is a, a weighing up that needs to be done out of fiscal constraint by the council and expansion in its program. And I guess we're not recommending that you go out and spend money for the sake of spending it. I think we all wanna see what the color of the government's money is through uh, the shovel ready projects and whatever else we can get to land in this district. Uh, but if things get really grim, in the jobs market, then at what point does the council need to wrestle with what's, how does it strike the right balance between restraint, because it's eventually got to be paid for, even if it is debt, and expansion to buffer the worst excesses of what could be a severe and protracted recession. And we just don't know right now how that's going to play out. Long answer, I'm sorry, but it, it, it is a moving feast at the moment. Further question? That answer quite didn't answer my actual question. I realise the Enterprise North Canterbury side may um, help the, um, the the business side, but how if we're creating and spending half a million dollars on a bureaucratic side, how's that side of it going to help? That, that was my question. I'll try again briefly. Uh, so at the moment, we don't have any resourcing to implement, um, to design and implement a recovery plan. We're doing it, and Simon's doing his day job, and then uh, being uh, needed, needing to spend time as with others through the core recovery group. So uh, there are other things that, that, that are within our work programs that we're budgeted to deliver. So... Uh, if we're going to spend time on the recovery plan, then we need to do some backfilling of, of that other work uh, that has already been subject to financial restraint. So it, it's, if, if you don't want us to work up a recovery plan, that's a call that you can reasonably make, but it has a cost associated with it. Councillor Duty. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting reading your programs of B going through for your recovery. Um, the strategy and planning, um, this live, work, Waimakari shop local, how has that been, uh, how effective has that been in promoting our shops in our three towns or work-wise? 
So look, that, that's an initiative that we think is a candidate program project worthy of consideration. And that's kind of got two sides to it. It's about supporting your local supply chain by wherever practical buying local. And, uh, and that may well be a question that is uh, legitimately asked of the council about giving preference to local suppliers and what is a tolerable level or not of, um, of a financial consequence that it's prepared to make to do that. Uh, and I'm not recommending that, I'm just saying that's a question that has already been asked. Uh, but it's also about supporting your local uh, shops and uh, hospitality outlets. Our view is if, if there isn't a strong support for such a program out of the respective promotions associations across our, our main towns, then that's probably not a project that is viable from our point of view. And we say that because A, we don't have staff time available unless we budget more to do that, to manage, design, manage, and implement that program. And B, and the Enterprise North Canterbury are more than overcommitted at the moment in practical business support to businesses. Uh, so in our view, and it's not a, it's, it's a discussion that we would want to have and need to have with the promotions associations. If they aren't behind that, then um, we can't force it on them. And we wouldn't seek to implement that without their strong involvement and support. This is not a question, but it is working well. Councillor Atkinson, your question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mine's around uh, back to the duplication. Exactly what's just been explained is something that concerns me and uh, wouldn't mind an answer for. The government is driving a local shop local uh, uh, campaign. It's all over your televisions, all over every bit of uh, communication that we have at the present time. Yet it seems to be a focus within what we're doing. And while I'm not saying we shouldn't have the discussion, that's not what I'm saying. I'm really concerned that what we have in here is actually really strongly duplicated by what's already happening by several central government. And that example, I just around that question of that duplication, that is a really good example that we're already going to start it if we're starting this conversation with that, you know. I mean, what's your view on that? Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. We need to kick the tires on it. Is, is it happening? To what degree is it happening? Can it carry on happening? Because it's going to be needed for a period of time. Um, uh, I don't, I, I, you know, just using that example, I don't think there is a central government agency who's actually funding or implementing a shop local campaign up and down the country. There's a lot of kind of adv advertising going on, but that's generic and across New Zealand. The question is about, is there a merit or not? And it's a question to be answered, councillor, I agree, in a tailor-made, customised program of that nature, project of that nature for the main centres in, in Waimakari District. And we, We've just highlighted it on a long list and we don't know the answer to that yet. We need to do some tire kicking over the next few weeks and bring that back to you in July for you to decide whether that's uh, still on the list. Oh, sorry. Further questions? I've got a recommendation. Um, I would like to move this if it's right this afternoon. Councillor Barnett's indicated that she's to second. So just in moving, um, I'd like to say firstly um, thank you to Mr Hart uh, and Mr Markham. There's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes, uh, talking with various businesses and community organisations to bring us forward uh, the start of this journey really. And we've, we've had a workshop where we've discussed uh, this. Council is not the sole is not going to have all the answers in this space. And I think that's been clearly indicated through questions and even freely through our staff. You know, the social side of the equation um, is very important. And Councillor Williams asked a very good question in that space, but it's working with the social service agencies, it's working with work and income who are part of this uh, grouping that's already existing 
to get them involved in part, part, uh, coming up with the solutions. If we need to be activating a social uh, recovery aspect, that's something we can look at at a later stage. At the moment, the most pressing item, well, firstly, as a council, we needed to signal to our community where we stood on rates. We did that last week. Uh, and that gave, and albeit that's got to come back and be endorsed officially by the council uh, on the 16th. But sending that message was really important. It's the first time I've actually had people stop me on the street and say thank you for what your council's done. Thank you to your staff for listening to us. Uh, and these are people that I would have thought were reasonably well healed, actually, that wanted an indication from the council that it was prepared to do something to acknowledge the circumstances that we're in. So indicating 1.5% actually sent a, a fairly strong message to a lot of people who fed back to us that they're appreciative that the council has listened and is acknowledging that we're in a time of hardship. It's not saying that we have the answers for the future. We've got a lot of work to do in that space, as was indicated last week. But now is about uh, forming a recovery plan and getting that underway. Work's been started in that space, but uh, I think that the slogan before, better than before, I, I don't mind that slogan, as well as um, coming up with the, uh, the Economic Recovery Advisory Group. I think that's a very good initiative and we'll have to think about who are party to that and we'll bring that back here as, as was said. Um, Enterprise North Canterbury have been getting on with work. They've been providing support to a lot of businesses that have needed cash flow advice and are doing a really good job in that space. Uh, and that's the feedback I've had from a number of businesses that have been struggling and have needed that advice, partnering with accounting firms to get them that practical support that they've needed. At the moment, a lot of the effects that are going on are actually masked by the wage subsidy. That's what everyone says to me that feeds back. So we don't actually know what the true effect is at the moment because it's sort of masked by that. I hope it's not as bad as anticipated. Uh, I really do. And we I was told in a local cafe that they'll find out the outcome of Bunnings today. Um, so I'm hoping that that's, that they revise their decision and that, we, who will know. But those sort of things happening in our community are important signals uh, when, when major retailers move away. It's not, it's not something we want to see happen. And our local small businesses don't want to see them struggling either. They've been through a lot. So council's part in this is to coordinate to show a lead where we need to, to advocate, but we're not going to have all the answers. Half 500,000 up, I should say to our staff, it's up to $500,000. It's not a free for all. Um, and that will need some good um, rationale put in that as to whether or not we, we expend that money. But I'm supportive of that because you can't have a plan without having some money to implement some initiatives. So look, uh, this is the start of the journey. Thank you to our staff for what they've done. I think the questioning is indicating that, you know, we've all got some, some concerns about it. We need to know where government's at in this space. We're seeing some trickle effect of, of their decision making at this stage, but they've got a $20 billion fund set aside. We're not sure exactly where that's going to be totally invested yet. And we've indicated our shovel ready projects. They've gone through to stage two. Hopefully they go through further. We will see. But look, I, this is the start of it, and I'm fully prepared to support it and thank to the staff for the work that they've done. Councillor Barnett. Yes, thank you. The Mayor is absolutely correct in that we, we're, this is a coordination role that we're taking. It's showing leadership to our district locally and it's using our local knowledge to get the best results for people in our district. Um, when it comes to economic development, if we don't do it, other councils near us will. And it's a matter of us leveraging the maximum benefit we can get for our ratepayers of whatever funding is available during the recovery period. We're going to need private investment um, it's, it's certainly not going to be something that's put all on ratepayers, and we're fully aware of that and the need to keep costs down. We're going to have to balance that throughout our discussions. Uh, but to me, the absolute most important thing is the community engagement side. Uh, we saw that in the earthquake. If people knew something was happening, they were far more willing to come along with us, even if it was a bad thing, um, than, than to actually be kept in the dark. And we have to step up in that area. And the recovery plan will be part of that. It'll be about forming partnerships, as you've noted. and But most importantly, to take the community with us, which includes... Um, all elected members, all community board, all staff, and all of our residents.
Councillor Atkinson, followed by Councillor Williams. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, I, I support this uh, um, around my questioning. You will have heard my concern, and that is duplication. We did that through the earthquake. There's been duplication, generally, generally not on our side. We would start something, the government would come along with exactly the same scheme and decide that they should do that as well. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we do the duplication. What I'm concerned about is that it happens. Uh, half a million dollars in the grand scheme of the disaster we have in front of us is not a lot of money. Um, but when it becomes ratepayers' money of half a million dollars or up to a million dollars by the time you do your second trench, third trench, whatever that may be, you're starting to talk serious money. When you put that into the country's money, it's actually a little different. <laughs> Instead of it costing everybody, you know, a dollar a week, it costs you uh, five cents a week when it's the government's money. So that duplication does concern me and, and it's something that I will certainly be keeping an eye on because we have had that before and I just don't want to see it again. Look, ANC have uh, worked well with uh, uh, with our businesses beforehand. I think there was, if my memory serves me right, which is probably not something that happens often, 120 uh, businesses in the service industry, just in Kaipoi alone, that uh, can attribute part of their saviour to the fact that they were involved in the ANC programs um, after the earthquake and brought them together to talk to each other just to make sure that they, uh, they could survive and, and get through and find out from each other what was happening in their own backyards and, and that was benef beneficial to all of them. I sometimes wonder whether we take these things too far um, and uh, we actually push too far when it's actually about communication and collaboration as opposed to actually getting out there and doing things when other people in all of these other industries are making it happen. But that's a question you'll always have and the proof's in the pudding. You never know until you, you get halfway through that or to the end of that, whether that's the right question or the wrong question, if you like. So we've, we've done this before. It's been a different circumstance and you've heard me say it before. This is a different disaster because it doesn't matter where in the world you go to, you can't get away from it. So, you know, we do need to take a lead in this and we need to be there. But I just want to reiterate the duplication and the fact that the lead agency in this is the government. We need to uh, be in there and make sure we're doing the right things, but the government is the lead agency. Councillor Williams. Yes, while I support what we're doing in principle, I think um, Councillor X is spot on. We don't want to create a duplication of things. I believe Enterprise North Canterbury are the experts at it. We don't want to duplicate and um, try to um, have two um, shots at the um, SAB. We're better off to, if, if they can't get government funding for the extra bit of it, well, maybe we're better off to shovel a wee bit of funding for them because they are the experts on it rather than us trying to um, do something. We are already working with our social agencies around. We've got some really, really good social agencies in why make a very, I think from memory, I think there's about 70 different um, small organisations and um, some of them are working very well. They are going to be needed and we are already working. I just I just see half a million dollars of rate pass money getting sw swallowed up in a bit of bureaucratic stuff and it doesn't get to the places where it needed, where we might be able to give a portion of that 500,000 to if Enterprise North Canterbury can't get that give them a portion, they can do far better with that kind of money than what we can do with um, the duplication. And it may be happened that we may have to pour a wee bit into some of the social service networks we've got here as well. They are the experts of that as well. Um, I just don't want us to take a leading role when the government is the leading role on it, and they will be supporting all those agencies. But we are, they've got a lot more money than we've got, and, um, you know, I just think we've just got to make sure we don't have a bureaucratic network and um, cost the rate part a lot of extra money where it's not necessary. Thank you, Councillor Blackie. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I can be brief. The last two speakers have covered some good salient points. Um, I'm, I'm just a little concerned about the this duplication thing, where we're going. If, if we're going down the money route, um, in, as a support mechanism, then ENC, as Paul has just said, is there up and running with a proven track record. We ought to just be literally giving them the dollars and saying, you spend it. Um, and, I, and, and apropos of that, I don't think we've allocated enough money into this, into the recovery scheme, as I, as I mentioned last week. 
uh, if we're going down the psychosocial support route, um, t again, Tessa's empire is there with a proven record, knows exactly what to do. It is already up and doing it. So I'm just worried that we're going to we're going to be careful. We don't reinvent the wheel internally. I appreciate that there's a there's a problem with, with government and us, but just be careful internally that we're not we're not getting down too far down the duplication road. Um, I look forward to seeing some boots on the ground progress with this committee and actually what we're going to, what are we going to be actually doing uh, real hard facts you know at the moment I'll steal Nikki's comment from last year we we're a bit of white hat and no cattle cast the mailing so I hope Al hasn't stolen your uh, your thunder there <laughs> that's big hat and no cattle but that's all right close enough <laughs> um look you know the, Back it up. <laughs> I'm still thinking about big hats and cattle. Um, like this, this council's need to, to to balance our community's needs now with with the needs of the future community. Um, you know, this this is our this is our council's earthquake moment, right? All over again. You know, we have to to balance the here and now with with, with the future, and, and we need to get that right. I commend the comprehensive approach of of this plan at a grassroots level because, you know, there's a big difference between central government saying um, buy local and us here at grassroots level saying buy from ABC on High Street or William Street because we know what we have here and who we have here. And again, I echo the sentiments that ENC is um, a, a really great um, organization to handle that. But um, again, grassroots is important. And on the same token, looking at the fantastic work that, that Tessa's um, community team has done, I've seen it firsthand, I've sat in her community welfare meetings. Um, again, there's a big difference in a central government saying, oh yes, we're going to put resources into MSD, et cetera, and us knowing what our people need right here, right now on the ground. So I absolutely stand behind what you're looking to, to achieve here. And, um, and again, yes, of course, proceed with caution with um, duplication, but uh, grassroots knowledge cannot be um, overlooked or underestimated. So hats off, little hat to you guys. Thank you, I support this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, probably a question that I that I would have for the two Simons. Um, do you see that this new um, role would, would be something that would be an addition or complementary to what we already have? I see that Enterprise North Canterbury's role will be to, to um, from my experience, will be to uh, visit Waimakariri to promote shop locally and I see the government's role in, in doing bigger things, but I see the role that you're looking at doing is maybe something that's complementary, but is looking after uh, the bigger picture or the, the, the uh, shovel-ready projects that might come about and help, project, um, um, help get those underway and organise them alongside... Do I need to have a question? <laughs> well, um, all right. Um, I just would like clarification that you see um, this role, this new role, as being something that is is complementary to what we have in place right now. Thank you. Uh, a, a quick comment, and then maybe Simon Markham might have some comments too. Um, I think if you look through the six programs and the 27 projects, there, there is a range of things that certainly E and C would, would want to lead and, and are highly involved in. I absolutely take the point that we don't want to duplicate anything that we have an existing network or agency doing and or that the government might do on our behalf, albeit at a much higher level, potentially. There is quite a significant role, I think, for council in the coordination and leadership of this recovery. And there, are, there is also a series of programs and projects within that plan that are council capital funded or ca council projects in their own right. So I think uh, the, the recovery role that we probably have is twofold in my mind. One is about leadership and coordination of 
the response and the recovery for our district by the, aid, the, the many agencies that will be involved in that recovery. Uh, and then monitoring how that is going and ensuring there is no duplication and partly coordination and leadership helps to eliminate uh, duplication. So I think that's one important role. And then the other important role is the delivery of anything that council has specifically that it wants to deliver towards recovery. And some of those projects are looking at our capital program, the shovel ready projects, um, leading of the review of certain strategies that may aid guide decision making over the longer term as we recover. So I think those are some of my initial comments. Do you wish to speak now, Council? You can speak if you'd like to. You're okay. Councillor Duty. Thank you. Um, and I'm just once again back on my shop local promotion. I, and I know that this has been done by government, but I really don't want to see that ever lose its momentum and because it's working well already. Um, I just noticed in Oxford yesterday just how busy they are up there with people coming out from Christchurch and buying and, and being part of it. And I just think this is one thing that we really do need to just keep pushing because the more people we have out here looking after our businesses, the more businesses will survive and work. Any further speakers? Just in right of reply, um, I, I, don't, I think there's been some good comment come through debate. I don't personally want to see duplication and, and actually from our staff, neither do they. From the comments that they're talking of. Someone's got to take a lead in this space and logically it should be council but it's partnering with other organisations and importantly in the yeah. terms of reference which is on page 67 Enterprise North Canterbury are there in the terms of reference as a, as a partner in this exercise. Before any ratepayer spending is um, was spent uh, or, or, or expended there will need to be a good case and that will require council sign off. So the sum of money that was set aside was just set aside. There's no, there's no decision being made on how that will be expended. It is simply set aside on the basis that we need to have something there in order to support initiatives that which may come out of this, but it will require this council sign off before that is spent and there will need to be a good case as there is in any instance where we're putting aside ratepayer investment. I, I endorse um, uh, the comments around shop local. I've long held that view. Um, um, but I, I do think that it's important who leads that exercise. And I know Enterprise North Canterbury, from a discussion I had with Heather the other day, they are looking at that very topic at the moment. And my understanding is they're looking at a new promotion to take a lead in that space. And they are the right organisation to lead that, um, supported by our council, of course, but supported by all the other partners in it, businesses, retailers, um, promotions associations. They've all got to buy into this because there needs to be a concerted effort that's got the same message for it to work. And then building on where the government's at in it in the space. And if you only have to drive into town to see big, big slogan and big billboards talking about buying and shopping local, it's everywhere at the moment. So it's I think I think our public get that message. Um, you know, only have to be out in our towns to see that happening over the various weekends or during the day. Rangura is very busy during the day uh, that I've noticed. I certainly heard anecdotally from retailers in Kaiapoi that they're doing doing okay as well. They're not doing as well as they were before, but the same as here. So right across our district, um, that message is getting through. But this is the start of the process, start putting in place uh, the um, a re recovery plan, being de developing that, and it will be with our endorsement and our buy-in going forward. So thank you to our staff for the work that they've done putting this together. We appreciate it. And I'll put the recommendation, uh, 7.2. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thank you, Simon and Simon. <laughs> right, we now come to um, re further reports. Just to let you know, Sophie's, Sophie's having some issues connecting in. So Jared's um, going to um, uh, look at... Uh, and 
looking after that report when he comes through to deal with item 8.7. So we'll deal with that at the same time. All right, so reports 8.1. Uh, it's the, there's a number of reports that have ordinarily gone to audit, so they've come here. So, okay, so the first is the 8.1 non-financial performance measures. Helene, this page is 69 to 87, everyone. Helene. So the reports for the 1st of January to the 31st of March this year. So um, fortunately, we're pretty much on a par with quarter three last year, which is good. Uh, COVID-19 had only really just hit before this quarter finished, and it did affect the results of four of the measures that, uh, that weren't achieved. But overall, we did a pretty good job. Everyone managed to do their reporting during lockdown and um, get the report together. So any questions? Any questions of Elaine? Count, Councillor Barnett followed by Councillor Blackie. Um, Helene, I just wondered about the Mahinga Kai area. Um, it's been, has this, is this report in the future going to reflect the changes to the long-term, the changes to the annual plan that we made in the budgets? Perhaps Mr. Palmer could assist. Duncan has indicated that some of these um, projects have been pushed back uh, and there will be some changes for the annual plan, long-term plan, yes. Councillor Blackie. Thanks, Alina. Page um, 72, that, that um, uh, essay you've written there about the leakage factor, um, you've said there that the um, confidence in the data is relatively low and it goes on to say that um, until a cost effective and accurate alternative to night testing is established, blah, blah, blah. And then the last line says a detailed report on the, on the, on the latest leakage assessment will be brought to you. And uh, what is the point of bringing a detailed report when you've just admitted that the data is useless, to put for want of a better word? Perhaps I might be, perhaps I, perhaps I might be um, better uh, placed. So, um, Certainly, we do have some concerns about the level of I and I infiltration. Um, that's inflow and infiltration, I and I, um, that is occurring in the Kaiapoi system. And trying to track that down is something which we actually considered this morning at management team and have approved a, a contract for uh, the Paraki, sorry, the Paraki Street. Uh, the Paraki catchment being subject to an assessment, actually using a different methodology uh, than we've used in the past, which has often been a house-to-house -house survey. There's been a, a methodology adapted and or developed and applied across the country where you actually install temperature sensors throughout uh, part of the network and you can actually detect changes in temperature of where inflow is coming from and so that is actually something that we're going to use in the Paraki catchment to try and understand where our inflow and infiltration is occurring and tracking that down further so that is that is a change that we're taking but we've certainly certainly got problems in that part of our you know post earthquake we still have issues that we definitely need to be addressing I and I because the capacity of the system can't be expanded affordably to actually cater with the flows that are that we're seeing or anticipating. Further questions? We have a recommendation. Some are prepared to move. Moved by Councillor Williams. Is it? Did you put your hand up? You'd have now. Um, yeah. Seconded. Councillor Blackie, Councillor Williams, did you wish to say anything? Councillor Blackie. Any further speakers? Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I certainly uh, welcome uh, any further reporting uh, and whatever system seems to be more appropriate uh, than the one we have. I mean, I was astounded um, when we had a report a couple of years ago 
that had that figure of 29% leakage and some schemes uh, far higher um, than that. Uh, I also note on page 73, which um, I find also rather concerning, is the um, we have a target of um, less than 450 litres of drinking water per day per resident, and our result is 624 litres. Um, I, I'm concerned about that. I don't know whether all um, this is a function of um, the methodology that is faulty um, in measuring uh, drinking water, but perhaps um, Mr. Palmer could comment on that. But um, if, if that's not the case, what are we doing to address the fact that that must be 50%, getting on for 50% over um, what we would um, are targeting for drinking water consumption? Well, question and con expressing concern, yes. I'm clear on the question. I'm just struggling with my system to be able to expand the page that I'm looking at of the detail that talks about uh, water supply because that is the average for the third quarter and what I was as you were speaking, interested to try and ascertain, if I could, what the what what the year-to-date average is, uh, noting that the third quarter is our summer season. So, I'm in, I'm hoping, and it's a hope rather than a uh, that that may reflect a um, a higher irrigation use. But I am not. I'm struggling to actually find the in in our associated um, work. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. just endorsing the need to get on top of this leakage, whether in fact it is um, true or not, we need some clarification. And of course, the only really real way to get a handle on it is to install meters, which um, is another, another entire debate. But um, uh, the information that we have to hand and have had in the past is that um, we have huge leakage from uh, our various water supply systems and uh, I for one need to be assured that is the methodology as Mr Palmer has indicated slightly uh, is suspect and if so let's fix it so that we do get some accurate um, data and if it if it is accurate then my god we need to address it uh, very quickly thank you to, just to say that the comment uh, in the report, the detail does anticipate, and it's in accordance with other years, the higher demand in the third quarter, and with a winter month reduction occurring, we should uh, be, it will be closer to achieving uh, the target on an annualised basis. Further, further speakers? Okay. Right of reply, if you would like to. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare that carry. Thanks, Elaine. Are you able to reconnect into the technology there? Yep. Okay. We'll, we'll continue. Um, but uh, if you've got a problem, let us know and we can get uh, um, Emmy or someone down to sync Sandra's 
um, out of the Zoom. All right. All right, hold on. That's right. I was just looking to see if you're ready. <laughs> so first, it's wrapped now to item 8.2, Pages 88 to 97, Mr. Markham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, this uh, is a report that uh, in ordinary times would have gone through to audit and risk committee in terms of providing the opportunity to comment on uh, the draft SOI. For those members of audit and risk, you'll recall that at the meeting of ANR committee just before the lockdown, uh, a number of ENC board members and the chief executive gave quite an extensive briefing uh, at that meeting around um, the uh, scope and, uh, of ENC activities. And just to jog your memories, because it is a while back now, remember they uh, showcased the um, uh, Waimakariri story uh, video that uh, is in preparation as part of uh, district marketing. Uh, uh, so uh, this is about, uh, a I guess, uh, an opportunity to provide any final feedback to the board before they finalise the statement of intent. Uh, that has been reviewed in the context of COVID. So it, it, it addresses the scope of Enterprise North Canterbury's activity. It doesn't uh, address the amount. And that's the issue that would need to be considered in our view in the context of a recovery plan. And um, I'll, I'll, you know, the comments in, a, in the earlier report around the recovery plan are, high, are relevant in the, in the sense of uh, uh, depending upon the scope and scale of government funding and how that plays out, is, is it appropriate or not uh, for the, the council to provide additional funding to Enterprise North Canterbury to upsize some of their programs. At the moment, uh, their budget is as it was, actually it's diminished because the inflation adjustment has been removed from their budget. So it is, it is no more than uh, what was foreshadowed in the original draft an annual plan. I'm happy to seek to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Markham. Questions? So Councillor um, Barnett, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Markham. Um, just wondering, obviously, a lot of the Enterprise North Canterbury programs have a pay-as-you-go type element to them for businesses who participate. Has there been any thought given to having some sort of fund set up to assist businesses who would normally contribute or but can no longer or those who may wish to contribute in the future? Look, I think that would be one of the options worth considering, and you may see a number of councils have established those kind of contestable funds for uh, struggling uh, businesses to apply for assistance outside of the structures of formal or ordinary support programs. Ordinarily, the business support, um, they access New Zealand um, uh, trade and enterprise money, uh, that helps fund professional advice to the business to help them with their cash flow forecasting and such like. Uh, and then they're able to turn on business, business mentors. That still requires the, uh, the business that may well be in significant difficulty um, to raise some money and, and invest some cost in, in, in that. And uh, they may not be in that position to do that. Uh, having said that, uh, look, if your business is in that position, then, uh, and I know it's incredibly easy for me as a uh, public sector employee to say, but if your business is in that position, then the reality might be the best thing is to wind the business up uh, uh, and, and not continue to try and make, uh, make it work in very, very difficult market circumstances. Um, uh, but but that's that's something that they wrestle with actually every day and through all of those 705 assessments they've done there are a number of businesses that are in that very difficult position. Just the second question I had was 
how appropriate do you think it is to have the business awards next year considering we're going into a recession and is that something the board may discuss further i'm imagining like um many uh, events there is uh uh it's put forward to 2021 it will get continuously monitored um probably the big one in that in that list is the olympics and frankly, you know, that's looking pretty unlikely, but they're not going to give up on that now. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that will be a watching brief. The other side to it is uh, by the time the 2021 awards come along, uh, Stadium Waimakariri is open. Uh, that's a real opportunity to showcase business in this district. And uh, I think that's a balancing act to be struck between um, the sort of restraint that we're all having to uh, become familiar with, but also when do you want to shout it, shout out that you've got some great businesses in this district and you want to celebrate that that success and and um, so that 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 I'm sure is under the uh, watching brief of the board. Further questions? Got a re recommendation. Councillor Atkinson's moving, seconded by. Councillor Dirty, do you speak, Councillor Atkinson? Yes, Mr. Beer, thank you. Um, yeah, look, this is an agency that does well in our district, and uh, when the times get tough, the tough get going, and they're one of those people in the agency that does exactly that. And you heard in that previous report about the 120 service businesses that, um, that uh, I talked about that... Uh, I've spoken to a few of them who attribute themselves, attribute uh, ENC to the uh, success of them still being in business um, after the after the earthquake. Interesting, the um, Councillor Barnett and the uh, business awards. That's actually an interesting one because I remember the first business awards after the earthquake, and they were postponed at that time and and put forward. Um, uh, I remember businesses talking about the fact that uh, wished it had never been postponed because those that had done what they'd done through that time and, and survived and actually got up and got going, it was actually the best thing that they went to at that, at that point. So, and, and that'll be always an arguable point. What do you do? You know, do you, which way do you go? And that's a decision for ENC to make. But we took some years to get to an SOI like this um, uh, and, and get... Um, uh, ENC into a place that we all understood what everybody was doing, you know, and and I think we've done that. We keep refining it, we keep going, and we keep making sure that each other knows what each other is doing. In my view, I think ENC do a damn fine job in this in this district, um, and they have a board which is which is um, has a cross section of people on it that actually give very good advice to them, um, and uh, and they follow that advice, uh, led by a team that clearly are successful in what they do. They seem to employ their teams well, and they seem to execute the business which is given to them well. And for that, I hope that everybody around the table will support this going through. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. Seconded by Councillor Doody, do you wish to speak? Uh, no, Councillor Atkinson has said all, but I, I, all I'd like to say is just definitely we very much promote this enterprise in North Canterbury and um, help it by generating a bit more capital to get them really moving on this area that we're going through at the moment that needs serious help. Councillor Williams followed by <laughs> Councillor Barnett. Yeah. Whilst I haven't always been a fully um, supporter of um, Enterprise North Canterbury and questioned um, the funding they get from the ratepayers and the, the council and what have you, I think this is a time where it's very important for Enterprise North Canterbury to actually shine and for us as a council to be proud of them, to um, stand up and be counted. And I think they will need to be standing up and be counted because um, our community is going to need them to help, not in the, in the business side of it, but it's a flow on to the, the normal workers that, um, in our community. And um, I'm, I'm hoping in 12 months' time, two years' time, we can all say, wow, that's the best thing we've ever supported in this area. So um, very important, I think, at this particular stage. So I think they will shine. Thank you. Councillor Barnett. 
Yes, I've certainly heard uh, absolutely glowing reports about what ENC have been doing through the, the COVID emergency. Um, I particularly want to acknowledge Miles Dalton, who's just been working so hard, and there's another person who's contracted in to help um, with businesses and cash flow, and they've been brilliant at bringing these partnerships together with financial services and to try and keep these businesses afloat. So uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the sterling work that's been done through this very, very difficult time. Um, but as we've said before, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and the major effect is going to be felt over the next um, year or even more than one year. Uh, we are in for a global recession, and that will impact on many businesses, local, um, national, and we will see a lot of changes during that time. I, uh, we're not sure who will get through it, and we're not sure who won't. Um, the only effect is we are going to see change. The only reason I really brought up the Business Awards is I, I just don't want to be accused of a, a let them eat cake scenario where um, some businesses are, are there celebrating buying expensive tickets for a wonderful dinner and an absolutely brilliant night out, um, whereas some businesses now can't afford to actually be at that event. So we've just got to be very mindful that some people are going to be in a very um, difficult situation and that that awards may have to be sort of perhaps reviewed in that light um, so that we don't we make sure that we're not appearing elitist, we're not appearing to pick favourites, that we're very much um, about all the businesses in Waimakariri, and that's what who ENC works for. So, uh, But going forward, I'm sure the board will discuss that. We don't know what situation we're going to be in 2021. It's anyone's guess at this stage. So I look forward to seeing further reports on what's going to be done in the future. Thank you. Uh, next, Councillor Ward, followed by Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want, I cannot un underemphasize how important Enterprise North Canterbury is and what great value that we get out of our investment in them. And I, I'm sure that most people don't really understand exactly as an independent arm of our district that how they can um, get extra funding, which the council cannot apply for. They they really work really, really hard to make important things happen and get extra funding. And um, that's what really uh, drives them is the extra funding outside of what we we contribute from the ratepayers. So they're really very good value. And um, I can't say enough how, how important they are. As far as the business awards, I think that 2021 will be a wonderful opportunity to um, showcase our new stadium. Um, and I'm sure that it, certainly there'll be no restrictions of numbers. So that'll be a great plus. Anybody will be able to enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, a question first about the market view data and how is that going to be married into um, the reporting of all these initiatives and what ENC is doing, um, what our recovery plan will yield. And we're, we're, we've got a benchmark pre-COVID, which will be the market view data. So enlighten us all about how that's going to be reported, presumably to audit and risk and it will give us presumably the ability to see what, well, first of all, see what's happening, but also see where the needs are and where we can target. Thank you. So um, it's uh, timely. Uh, so at the moment, we're tracking towards the 21st of July Audit and Risk Committee to do the presentation that we might have otherwise done before, uh, but with the program was interrupted by the lockdown. So, and uh, we are, um, uh, I won't go into the details, but got better data on uh, around employment now. We've got census results coming through, et cetera. So that would be when we would have an opportunity to give you a high, uh, an, uh, an update and an overview of how employment's tracking, um, how uh, expenditure is tracking. Um, happy, happy to uh, to be do, doing that at the at the July count um, audit and risk committee meeting. Did you speak, Councillor Stewart. No, you were just a question. Yep. Further speakers, rather reply, Councillor Atkinson. 
No other replies, so I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thank you, Mr. Markham. Just wait for a couple of minutes while we've just the next staff member comes. Thank you. Okay, so we now come to 8.3, pages 98 to 125, the outcomes of the Council's Health and Safety Risk Register Review, um, Charlotte and Pace of Liz. Charlotte, so um, this this here only works one at a time, so we click off in between questions, etc. So thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr Mayor, Councillors. Um, as mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Liz Ashton to present to you the outcomes of the WDC Health and Safety Risk Register for March. Um, this would have ordinarily been presented to the Audit and Risk Committee previously, but obviously we've had delays given the um, COVID-19 situation. Um, it does present, this is now the, the seventh review, so I have presented this previously to um, Audit and Risk, um, including the Health and Safety Risk Register and Associated Action Plan for any high risk or high consequence actions. Um, I will take the report as having been read, however, just wanted to raise a couple of key points um, to bring to your attention. Uh, as noted in the recommendations, we have recently trans transitioned the risk register across to the PROMAP risk and um, compliance module that you will have seen earlier today, the um, COVID-19 risk register was in that format. Um, so hopefully we'll have given you some level of familiarity of how that looks. Um, that has also meant therefore that there has been a change in rating methodology. So we do have um, a variance in uh, risk ratings, although they have been uh, the same likelihood and consequence because they've, the uh, Health and Safety Risk Register is now aligned with the WDC Risk Management Framework methodology. Um, so therefore you will see that difference in risk rating scores. Um, uh, there have been no significant changes in those risk assessments during this time. Um, however, there has been a significant improvement in the quality of the descriptors um, and control measures for each of those risks as they have been transferred across to that um, risk and compliance module. Um, and included in 4.2, you will have seen that we have the top 20 health and safety risks available to you for your reference. Do I have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Charlotte, just, uh, I mean, just actually what you were speaking on, it says the change uh, under 4.3, the change in rating methodology does not reflect that any change in operational practices. If we take one of those, which we had in 19, uh, 2019 as high, and then we swap, well, we've put in a further 19, sorry, eight, uh, 19, 20, 21 to high. How can we say that makes no difference or change to the operation? Because if the rating's gone up, then what you have to do to mitigate that must go up, which means people must have to make an adjustment to how they operate to make these things happen. Is, is, have I got my assumption totally wrong or is that... 
sorry. Perhaps so. Yeah, yeah. So in, cha in changing the rating structure, and what's tr triggered so many to be high, and when you look down the list, there's a lot that are now scored at 200 points, which under the revised framework just catches it under a high banner, which is there. the typical scenario of that is um, the, uh, the consequence of the event occurring is um, deemed high, and that might be serious injury or death. At the moment, the likelihood sitting, at, and as it was previously, is unlikely. Now, that translates to a score of two in the likelihood scale and 100 in the in the consequence scale, which gives you a score of 200. I, I think one of the things that we'll reflect on is are they genuinely um, unlikely or are they rare? And that might be something that we can reflect on further because I, I don't think we've quite got the transition right. In terms of under our previous arrangement, there would have been essentially no change in our risk assessment if it had been if we'd used our old what was called the five by five scale so you had a consequence of somewhere between one and five and a likelihood of somewhere between one and five and the way that that frame was put together changed our changed our view of the risk so i think what this has done in my mind is just given will give us pause to think about have we just got that mix quite right the underlying risks and mitigations don't necessarily change but if if we thought in a in a rating scale and this is where we need to reflect further if if an event is likely to cause serious injury or death and we have have our rating somewhere between rare unlikely likely probable and almost certain is the five things if we've got things that are like in the unlikely category then perhaps we should be doing more to try and reduce that uh, risk which is your point about surely shouldn't we be doing more but i'm not sure we should be doing more we might just need we, we first need to just have a look at our how that scale is working because it, it doesn't feel quite right to me to be honest if i may clarify mr mayor it's a well while your answer is a helpful one to to the way i'm thinking uh, but it says here that does not reflect any change in operational practices now if we have probable likely and unlikely if it's likely then there are changes to people on the ground that they must make to mitigate likely as opposed to unlikely now if we've jumped from having one of those to now 22 that makes an absolute massive difference, does it not, to the people on the ground that are, who are actually carrying out the exercise? Might not on the paper, but it certainly does if you're setting up a work site. And, and I think that's a fair question, Councillor. Some of them, though, we would argue, you know, uh, as an example, one of them is around people driving using our fleet and having. An accident, the, the potential consequence could be serious de serious injury or death, albeit touch wood and more than touch wood. A good practice in management. We haven't had that scenario unfold yet. Um, we've looked at that, and at the moment, we honestly can't think of anything more we can do in that to what we're currently doing to further reduce the likelihood. Maybe we need to re review our, our risk rating on that, but there's probably not many things we can do in terms of either our fleet or driver training, or apart from doing less kilometres, which we typically are doing less of those, being on the road less. Um. Um, so one of the reasons why it says it doesn't reflect any change in operational practices or decrease in control measure effectiveness is that what we've basically done is we've taken all of our prior operational practices and control measures, and we've translated them across into a slightly different risk rating methodology. Um, what that has probably given us pause to do, as Jim was mentioning, is actually 
check whether or not where previously the, the rating methodology gave us a lot of lows and medians, um, we probably now need to go back and ask ourselves the question whether or not we have been uh, against the new rating methodology, whether we are rating them accurately. Um, we do have a lot of uh, already quite effective control measures in place, and those are sort of within the, the overall risk register that you have in the report. Um, and I think probably what we as a, and, and the management need to do, to team need to do is actually sit back and reflect and say, and as Jim said, is ask the question, so with the new rating methodology, should we be saying something is unlikely or is it rare to drop it down that, that level? Um, in terms of everything else, everything else has remained the same. So um, all, that the, all that that change reflects is, is, is simply a, an alignment with a new rating methodology. So in the interim, while you're reflecting, what risk does that put us, put us at with 21 high risks now as opposed to one um, until such time as we've reflected? So in terms, as, as it says in the report, it hasn't changed our operational practice. So the, the years of work that we have put in to reduce those risks um, as to as low as is reasonably practicable still remains in place. Nothing has changed operationally on the ground. Um, so all of those control measures that we have in place, all of the procedures, the equipment, the PPE, the um, plant that we, have, that we have put in place over that period of time, has not changed. So, um, so therefore, this is about a rate, rather about a rating methodology, rather than than specifically about what is actually happening on the ground. Councillor Williams. Yes, on page one hundred and one, um, if our contract of safety requirements not adequate, the government gives, um, I think, a certain standards every business in New Zealand has to operate at. Are we saying that the government standards aren't good enough and we should be lobbying them to upgrade their systems or are we putting our posts too high? Because it can't be worked both ways. Um, it's a question, it's a real interesting good question. Um, are we leading are we leading the safety standards and should we lobbying the government to higher standards or? So um, our current contractor management processes are actually in um, alignment with the government standards. So basically the work, WorkSafe has put out guidance in regards to managing contractors um, and working uh, in partnership or um, with uh, in alignment with other companies. Um, we've made sure that all of our contract management processes are actually um, aligned to and compliant with their guidance. Um, so yes, they are leading the way uh, and we are ensuring that we are matching that expectation. Yeah, the supplementary question then, um, if we are in alignment with the um, government standards, what they're requiring all businesses to operate on, why, won't we, uh, why aren't we allowing some of the other bus businesses to operate here because their standards aren't high enough when they already have to get to that government level? So that's around us doing our due diligence to ensure that we are working with organisations that are meeting those standards. Um, so that's part of our role as a PCBU is to ensure that the people that we contract with are matching the standards that are expected um, by essentially through by WorkSafe and the, and the government. So yes, we are. That's that's part of our role. Any further questions? Sorry. Councillor Blakey, followed by Councillor um, Redmond. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Um, page 120, um, under high um, consequent risk boat operations, practice rescue plan, what is that alluding to in the context of our council? 
so our water unit uses um, motorised boats on the on the ponds, and so therefore just ensuring that they so they have a boat operation standard operating procedure. They have uh, maritime uh, licensing as well, and then obviously ensuring that for any high risk actions that they're undertaking. So we, we, we would do this for things like confined space entry or working at heights that, but for boat operations as well, that they're just practicing any drills that they need to practice in terms of if there is, if there are any um, uh, adverse outcomes. And does that apply, that applies to any council staff um, or, or elected members or anybody on say the river in, in a boat? Uh, if you are operating a craft on the river on council business, then my assumption is that, yes, that would be the case. So um, I would have to get a better understanding of exactly what the operations were, but um, yes. Redmond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm a little bit confused on the change in methodology. Um, I take it that the 14 low risk figure is actually the same as now one low figure. So I just wondered, are you going to recalibrate the new uh, technique so that we get something a little bit more consistent? Is Mr. Palmer indicated before, previously low to medium had quite a heavy weighting, and now where medium to high has a very high rating, it doesn't look as good as the old myth, 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 <laughs> like watching the bloopers. Um, yeah, uh, are you going to look at recalibrating? So, I mean, I don't know what the answer is here, but it seems to me that we get two different answers from the same sort of circumstances. Sure, and that's that's something that we have flagged, is that yes, we will look at, at I suppose, uh, the, the calibration has happened, so we've, we've, we've switched over systems, um, and this was because, uh, and this is what ha has happened in risk, risk management across the organisation. People do it differently in different areas. So as an organisation, what we are beginning to do is actually um, start to use a single methodology. And that will mean that sometimes we get uh, outcomes that are a little bit of out of, out of kilter from the, the previous outcomes. So risk management, be it in project management, or be it in health and safety management, or be it in corporate, um, we want to try and bring them all in alignment with the same rating methodology. So that means that we are going to get um, pickups like this. And yes, on the next um, round of reviews, we will be looking very closely uh, and ensuring that those, uh, those descriptors and ratings have been fully interrogated to make sure that they are as accurate as, as is possible. So yes. Sorry. One further comment from me is, the purpose of the risk assessment is not only to understand, you know, to, to sort of try and quantify the effect, but it's actually a prioritization mechanism. So where do we actually invest our energies? And that's actually a relative comparison. So what's our highest risk thing for our business as opposed to lower risk matters? So this, while it, it sort of has a, a science around it per se and helps us, the, the real purpose of putting some risk assessment is to actually understand where should we be investing our effort to make sure that we we are focused on the things that create the um, have the highest exposure to us and one of the things that we focus on is particularly when you think about the likelihood and consequences of actions or events we particularly focus on what are the consequences so think about anything that could kill somebody or seriously injure somebody is something that we're very, we're far more interested and focused on that as opposed to something which could occur regularly but doesn't <laughs> doesn't have any great consequences so um, we're particularly focused on looking at the consequences and thinking about what are the mitigation strategies and uh, Charlotte provides us a regular update on everything 
that has a serious, a, a very serious outcome, even though the likelihood of it is low. And the experience from some of other organisations say they are the ones that get the most into difficulty or challenge. You know, it's the it's the um, uh, plane crash scenario. You know, uh, they don't occur very often, but when they do, uh, it goes badly wrong. And making sure that you do everything you possibly can to minimise the risk of it of that outcome is is where we focus. So, it is about helping us prioritise. But I acknowledge that um, we can we need to refine that. If you're looking for the graph that actually it's not sitting in this report that actually makes that up on page 41 of our agenda is actually the, the matrix that we use that actually then translates to the high, medium and low risk. So if you wanna see how those risks are planning out, it's that page there that um, explains our, our current risk matrix and, and how things get to be high, medium or low in that assessment. Any further questions? So we have recommendation here. Some are prepared to move. I'll move. Oh, Councillor Redmond will move it. Seconded by Councillor Mailings. Councillor Redmond. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I don't wish to make any further comment, except that it's an interesting exercise in how this all works. I'm suddenly learning what a pro map is, uh, something I'd heard of, but didn't really understand. So anyhow, I'm happy to move the report. Second of Councillor Mailings. Any further speakers? Nothing to respond to, so I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. So next we have item 8.4. So Mike is on his way in. We're now at 8.4, which is pages 126 to 135. That's on the sustainability strategy implementation. Um, Mr. O'Connell. <coughs> right, good afternoon. Um, okay, the first report was done back in March. This is the second one. It was has been bumped to the, to this meeting. <clears throat> it's an ANR uh, uh, audit and risk committee report. Um, it really is the second um, summary of of, of actions uh, in the implementation plan from the sustainability strategy for the period January to, to March of this year. Um, and really, there's there's not a lot to say about it other than that it's it, it's it's an ongoing. It's it's a qualitative measure of how we're performing at the moment. And I think there are some concerns out there that, we're, that we possibly should be looking at quantitative measures. We haven't got them specifically in the strategy at this stage, the measuring and reporting, uh, but that will come. And really, I think that's all I can add at the stage. As I say, the report has already been read. And um, just, a, just a quick thing though to document, we did, we did uh, spend five thousand dollars less in fuel in the second quarter whether that was january holidays or some influence of the COVID, i'm not sure yet but we'll have a look i can bring those numbers back for example in the third quarter report in august uh, to see where we're tracking on fuel for example so i'll, I'll leave it at that point uh, and take any questions for the time with the recording system so Questions? Councillor Redmond, followed by Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On page 127, clause 4.4, uh, could you update progress with those discussions? 
we did have a submission in the annual plan that said we weren't doing very well in that space. So I just wondered if you could update us. Sorry, we weren't doing very well. Okay, um, look, really that's not my area. That's Vanessa um, has been looking at that. Uh, I, just before lockdown, we did have some meetings about that looking at potential suppliers and there was some issues around whether we put it up for tender, whether how we do the process, but there were two or three interested parties in, in the work we had doing because I think they had got in contact with us because they'd seen our, our work in that area was in the public realm and they'd, they'd seen it and the field companies came to us and that, I think we had two, maybe three. So that was where I left it in March. So I really can't say anything more than that. Uh, there's a briefing that we're, um, I can't remember whether it's next week or the week after, I think it's next week, um, that talks about, e it's an update on EVs uh, for your consideration. So yeah, I think there is still some progress in that space. So we'll share more next week. Any further questions there, Councillor Redmond? So, Councillor Stewart. Thank you, I'm having issues with joining this meeting, uh, clearly. Um, a, a couple of things that I, I raised last time you brought um, a, um, uh, a report to us, which is just lack of progress on in-house recycling. And I notice still here, um, there is not um, uh, a recycling system for the in-house rubbish. And also, we still have uh, paper cups here when they should go, and we should be on glass. Uh, what is the um, what is the difficulty here? Oh, sorry. Um, I can't say exactly. We we've, we've got the bins. We've got about 10, 12 sets of them sitting here and in storage, waiting to come out. And I'm just not sure what the hold up is in rolling them out. We'd like to have them rolled out, our, our um, sustainability sort of action group. Uh, it probably lies with property to, to make that happen, to bring them out. And, and other things on the, on the paper cups, but that's something that we're, we're working through. And we've got actions, reinforced actions for the second strategy coming out, the, the stage two strategy to, to look more closely at disposable items and things like that. The question. They're really basic, simple things. Could we have an email round to councillors um, about what is the difficulty and when are you going to roll out the in-house recycling and just get rid of those through the building? Thank you. We did, during the budget meetings, call for a report more broadly about the actions of the internal working party just to see where those matters were at, because there was a submission that, drew, that referenced that, and there was some delays. So we did recall on that. So perhaps more broadly, um, Mike, you could um, just pick it up with Elaine, and uh, we would welcome perhaps a report back or an email back in the interim would be an answer to Councillor Stewart's question, but a, a broader report on where those actions are at. Similarly, there is a briefing session on the 23rd, I think it's the 23rd of June, Mike, uh, it's either the 9th or the 23rd, my memory's failing me, about sustainability update where we've got an hour to talk about trying to bring a number of sustainability issues together for Council. So if you wanted to, you could leave it till then, um, but picking up the comments of colleagues, either a report or bring it up at the time of the briefing if you've got time. Councillor Barnett, followed by Councillor Doody. Hello, just a couple of questions. The first one is, um, what is the impact of COVID-19 emergency procedures had on the sustainability strategy in-house? Um, it hasn't really allowed us to, to meet face to face, and um, but saying that, it's a, <clears throat> really it's been allowed me to progress the second stage of the strategy um, and develop actions for for <clears throat> excuse me um, for the upcoming strategy, um, re the revision process. Um, we are 
working through as much as we can uh, in the in the the space that we have, and that's what our report is up until March. So there's not much more I can really add to that. <laughs> Sorry, and the second question, I just, um, are you working with uh, the portfolio holder from the system, who's got sustainability on the council to get some elected member support as well? Uh, yes, I am. And that's something that we're still pushing along with. And it's actually a, a new action in the, in the uh, upcoming strategy revision, the new revised action. So that definitely is on the agenda. Councillor Doody. Thank you. Um, thanks for this report. I'm just uh, interested in um, this um, household solar energy, um, not that you had that presentation by a particular company. I'm just wondering, um, moving forward, what is your, what is your thoughts on uh, perhaps promoting the solar, household solar energy by the council? How do you what would that, and that was something you could work with your um, briefing. So I'd really like to know just how we can perhaps promote and, and uh, that forward. That's that's a good point. Um, that, that's something that we've certainly got as an action for the upcoming strategy to look at producing public, um, in fact, I can just about almost get the wording, develop um, practical guidance for residents to encourage sustainable building practice, that kind of thing. So definitely that's something that we've got and trained to do through our, through our building unit and so on. So make, make information publicly available. Councillor Stewart. I'm having difficulties again. I'm offline um, after being told I couldn't possibly, I am. Um, just again, page 131, um, action, SC8 about turning off lights, monitors, and appliance when not in use overnight. Um, this is, can you tell me why isn't that just done? Is that done or you, it's got ongoing here? I can't see why uh, that is a difficulty if staff are told that they must turn off every light before they exit the building and all devices. Why is this? Um, uh, ongoing. Um, we've actually said that as a well, it's an action complete as and we've we've tried to send out the messaging, but yes, there's still ongoing. I, I I notice it when I leave the building that there's still someone's left and someone's left the light on, for example. Apparently, there's a there's an issue with, with through IT about whether monitors or PC should be powered down or just left it sleeping overnight. It's it's more energy efficient to leave them powered down rather than actually switched off. And there's up, things like updates and so on and virus checks. So it's a bit more complex than, than um, it looks. Um, but we still try and do that through through your messaging, through, our, through the Gull newsletter, et cetera. Further questions? Councillor Barnett, you're prepared to move. Seconded by Councillor Atkinson. Councillor Barnett. Yes, thank you for this report, Mike. It's very comprehensive. It sees which shows us where you were at as of end of March. And obviously the environment has now changed a little bit. Some things we've gone a step forward, such as working from home, and in other steps we may have taken a step back, such as needing to use disposable items rather than any sharing of um, reusable items and so on, reusable coffee cups and so on can be a bit more tricky. Um, however, I think this will evolve as we go forward. It's certainly something that the public are demanding that we uh, keep trying to make progress in and that we need to show leadership to the community. So I commend your group for putting your hands up to do that. And I do encourage that you work with the portfolio holder so that um, you get the right traction at governance level as well. So thank you for the report. Seconder, Councillor Atkinson. Mr. Mayor, look, this is something that we will always grapple with. There will be always things that go wrong and there'll be always things that go right. Um, it's an ongoing, as long as we're moving forward and working with each other to make it happen, as is clearly evident in the report by the results of it, then I think we are in the right space. The speed will always be a question. 
and uh, I think that we just need to keep on working with it and the questioning that Mike will get I'm sure takes on board and uh, it happens every time you sit in front of us Mike there's those questions so I think that it's very pertinent that we do that but we continue to improve and uh, and, and get to a point where, uh, where everybody's satisfied. I have no particular worries at the pr present time with anything in this report, but there will always, as I say, be questions around speed and uh, different people's expectations. Further speakers? Just throw my two cents in worth. Um, look, Mike does an actual fact um, liaise with me quite regularly. Um, this is a massive piece of work that they've undertaken and it's it just gets bigger and bigger really by the day whenever you look at the implications of how sustainability does and should, rightfully should, overarch everything that we do. And um, this stage one that, that we are, reporting on at the moment is really an in-house thing for us to get our house in order and stage two will we'll take the strategy a little bit further out into our organization and, and start to get into the community but um, I would just like to go back to um, page 57 in our agendas where um, Simon very nicely put in a, a we picture from Ariana Huffington, nothing should go back to normal. Normal wasn't working. If we go back to the way things were, we will have lost the lesson. May we rise up and do better. And that goes for sustainability, infinity and beyond. <laughs> so um, I would just really like to, to um, challenge this council to support the initiatives and um, help us all to keep pushing them through and, and make this happen because um, we need to take the lead in our district with these changes. And um, so far, so good. We just need to be a little bit louder at trumpeting what we're doing. So thanks for your work, Mike. A few of the speakers, right of reply, Councillor Barnett. So I'll put the recommendation, all those in favor, aye. aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, right, now we come to 8.5, um, is Paul, joining us or is, is he zooming Paul Christensen or Jeff Jeff was Jeff was here <laughs> might just uh, just just might just need to wait a minute they're just they're cleaning the station now So, so you're not you're not operating, Sandra. It is. So you you're in Zoom now or not? Okay. Thanks, Mike. So now we come to uh, item 8.5, the financial report for the period ending 31st of March, uh, pages 136 to 179. So we've got Mr. Christensen and Mr. Will Millwood. Mr. Christensen. Thank you. Um, this report is um, to the end of uh, 31 March. Um, so it was meant to be presented to the order and risk book because that's uh, got cancelled. Uh, so it's um, a little bit um, later reporting than we normally would do. Um, the three main report points for this report, um, the surplus was 3.4 million against a budget of 10 million. Um, the debt at the end of March was 160 million um, against a budget of 185 million. And uh, reven revenue from the development contributions uh, was 4.5 million. Uh, which was under budget, which was 9.3 million. Um, the, uh, um, revenue cash flows from operations was 17.4 million, um, uh, which is down against the previous same time the previous year, and um, uh, cash flow cash flow um, spent on investing was 27.9 million. Um, 
uh, yeah, is there any other questions on the report? Thank you, Mr. Christian. So, any questions, colleagues? No questions. Some are prepared to move. I'll move. <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Bryan. Um, really, it just it all says it all there in the report. It's very it's good reporting as always, and uh, do appreciate the effort that goes in here. I think one, if we look at our, the LGEP report recently, and it does commend our council and its financial performance and the work that we're doing in this space. So it's a credit to, to you, Mr. Christensen, Mr. Millwood, and all the team that's in behind supporting. So thank you for your work in this space. Second, our councillor Brown. There are any worship comments, Mr. Mayor? Well done. Any other, any other uh, contributions, any speakers? Nothing to respond to. So I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Um, uh, now we're in item 8.6, pages 180 to 217, the Capital Works Report, which is a report in the name of uh, Mr. Brown, Mr. Cleary, and also Mr. Young. So who's taking the lead on the report today? Mr. Young. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, yes, presenting this report to you, which has been collated um, obviously, during the COVID um, uh, process and reflects really our uh, state uh, up until the end of March. I think it's fairly clear, I won't go through too much of the numbers, there's an awful lot of numbers in there, but I think it's fairly clear to, uh, to everybody reading this that um, the numbers aren't as we would like them to be. Um, they are lower than I think all of us would uh, be comfortable with. We have sat in front of you with, um, on several occasions talking through this report, um, and it's clear we're not making as much progress in a timely manner to improve the numbers. What I would like to suggest is that there is an awful lot of work going on in the background which are improving the processes uh, that, are, um, that we are working our way through. And in particular, I think what you will find in this coming year is that we have begun the year in a far more uh, ready state, or we will be beginning the year in a far more ready state uh, to advance uh, the various projects in this coming year. While we have been working on uh, reporting the projects through this last um, 12 months, and indeed, acting on that information as quickly as we can through that uh, time frame. It's always really difficult if you haven't ex actually established the project right from before the year even starts in a way which uh, is going to give a better chance of success. We're in that process at the moment. We now have um, procurement plans prepared uh, and in front of our um, our deliverers uh, on all projects and those deliverers in particular uh, Kelly Lavalley the PDU manager is working through preparing with her staff detailed uh, programs for each of the projects coming up in the coming financial year. This is going to be a really a key I think in improving uh, the performance of the, um, the delivery of the projects that along with the other step that uh, your staff and managers have made, which is to go through that program 
uh, with a far more critical eye than I think has happened before uh, and pushing out a lot of those uh, projects for further years so that uh, we're not being overly optimistic in terms of what we can achieve. I think as you've probably seen, there has been a little bit of a process, I think, where we have allowed a bow wave to build up as things have delayed. Uh, we have kept them um, in our program without possibly looking as, as much as closely as we should at the work that uh, is already there waiting for us. Uh, and whereas in this year, we certainly have taken a far more rigorous uh, approach to that. Um, other than that, I'm not sure whether Chris and uh, Jared have anything they'd like to add as a summary. Yeah, I suppose, um, yeah, yeah. So there's specific reference to a number of the projects and under, under the, um, and I don't think it's worth me going through, but we're happy to take questions on any of them. But if you look through under the categories of roading, drainage, we've actually tried to pick out the key projects there and give you uh, a description of, of what the issue was on them. Um, look, you're going into the coming financial year. From a three waters point of view, we've pushed out a huge amount. So, um, and also from a recreation point of view, other than the indoor courts. Um, so the indoor courts project is going to be a big one and that's look underway. Um, that's been uh, delayed uh, by COVID for we would have expected that to be further through. But the key one is going to be the roading program. And there is a real risk around that, as we talked about at the annual plan deliberations. It's very ambitious. Um, the, so we're attacking that on a number of fronts. We've got a, a far uh, bigger project and program management role in the, in the role um, to date where Don has um, reporting. Um, that's going to be a much more active role in the coming year. Um, but the other uh, thing is, when you look at the uh, within the report at the roading projects in particular, we um, we've got a number of them that to get them going, we have to get some decisions fairly early. And we've already brought one of those recently to the UNR committee for Flaxton Road. There's another report going to the Rangiora Ashley Community Board for. Southbrook, so we're going to make sure that we get those in front of elected members early so that uh, key decisions can be made and, and we're making sure we get the resource in place. So um, that's, a, that's a really big focus for us in the coming year. Um, when you stand back and look at the total dollar spend, the dollar spend that we're proposing to spend in the coming year approximately matches what we actually are spending in this current year. So um, that does give uh, us more hope that we can actually achieve it. Um, previously, we did have a, a, a larger um, spend that was, that was unrealistically high. So yeah, well, look, um, Chris, Don and I are happy to take any questions. No, that's fine, thank you. Questions. All right, we have a recommendation, so moved by Councillor Atkinson, seconded by Councillor Blackie. Councillor Atkinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I, I, I move this in support of what's happening here, but I've heard these words before many times. We will meet it, we will do this, we will do that. We don't. We need to. And if I sound a bit grumpy about that, I am because for two or three years we've been told that. We've brought Don on to, to sort this out so that we don't have the bow wave. We're hearing now, and I get the reason that we have the roading projects. I absolutely get why that is a bit of a risky place to be. However, we need to meet it. We need to, outside those that are uncontrollable, we need to make sure that we meet our program. And if that means cutting back our ambition to do so, we need to make sure that we do that. So I certainly hope that we will get to where we need to be in this, in the, for the rest of the year and, the, and, sorry, for the next year. We have a 10-year plan coming up, and my warning shot across the bow is that I want 
for the next 10 years a work program that this council can meet generally. There will always be some anomalies, but they are far too big and need to come down. And we need to make sure of that. While the engineers are lovely at designing programs and that's your forte, that's what you should do, we need to make sure that our ambition matches our action. And we need for our ratepayers to make sure that that happens. Councillor Blackie. No, thank you. Councillor Atkinson's covered that well. Councillor Stewart. Yes, thank you. I wasn't going to say a single thing because, but Councillor Atkinson has spurred me into action, which is to say exactly that. Heard it before. Don Young is here to deliver. I'm surprised that I, he's repeating what he said a year ago. I'm just saying I'm tired of it too. I, you need to deliver. And all I can say is exactly as, <laughs> as Councillor Atkinson said, a 10-year plan coming up. We need to deliver on what we're saying we're going to deliver. And if we cannot, and I'm really disappointed that in taking all these projects out and flipping them on, um, we still have um, some uh, uncertainty about whether we're going to deliver. I understand that the roading, um, the roading um, program is ambitious. But look, if, you, if there is any, any uncertainty about um, delivery, let's just undercook it and deliver it and have that as a focus rather than pushing the stuff out. And now we have got a bow wave. We've got all the stuff that you tell us we were going to deliver in a capital works program this year has rolled on to 2021-22. I don't think that's a goer. Um, and I am really going to be watching what you, um, what you do with um, this year because Mr. Young produced um, I've got the screeds of it um, at home, a great big Capital Works program that was going, to, was going to happen, and it did not. And part of it is COVID, yes. But in fact, COVID really only hit about um, uh, February, March, which is the tail, well, it's over halfway through the program um, for, our, um, for our year. Um, all I'm saying is I'm tired of hearing the same thing. So let's just pitch it where you can be absolutely assured of delivering it. Thank you. Councillor Barnett, followed by Councillor Doody. Councillor Barnett. Look, in a perfect world, I would like to see this at 100% too, but we're not in a perfect world. And I think it's a little unfair to actually put all the blame back onto the staff when you look at some of the reasons behind some of the major capital um, projects delays, especially in roading, Skewbridge is because NZTA hasn't given us the money. And so that money still stays to, needs to stay there because we are now trying to pitch for it as a shovel ready project. Um, so we're in a catch 22 situation. If we suddenly got the money from NZTA and didn't have budget, what would we do? How would we, how would we justify that to rate players? Um, some of these projects were actually pushed out because of the amount of consultation that needed to be done with ratepayers, which is actually a really good reason to make sure it's done right. Flaxton Road is an example of that. It was the community board and utilities and roading who sent that back for further consultation. Points Road was delayed because we haven't been able to have a public meeting. So there's quite a numerous, if you actually look at the reasons, that there are some very good reasons why a lot of these projects got pushed out. And some of them were really major. And if you have a few major projects pushed out, your percentages look terrible. So I can see a lot of justification in here for what's been done. And our entire annual plan has now been revised. So therefore the capital projects in the 2021 year will look completely different. Um, so I, I am aware of the concern and I, I share it. I'd like to know what's happening in the next year and I'd like to know that it's realistic but I also understand the very shifting sands that staff face in trying to pin multi-year projects to one year and also trying to add the um, 
complexity of having to go through multiple consultation phases and relying on funding from exterior sources. So uh, just, just a little bit of caution in, in the amount of responsibility that we've put on to staff because elected members have some responsibility in this too. Thank you. I'd just like to say to the three members sitting there, congratulations, well done. You're working very hard. You've had a big task to do to bring us back down after COVID-19 and to, to get where we need to have a, a sensible rate increase. So from my point of view, thank you. And I'd just like to share in the comments that are being expressed. I think Councillor Barnett put it really well. I, I, I understand the reservations that colleagues have in the way that this is put. And yes, I think the message is well understood by our staff, but I think there does need to be a fair balance here. And I, I remember talking to, um, I hear Mr. Wilwood saying in a, in a forum we were in that there, there perhaps is a better way of expressing uh, this, those that we can actually achieve and those that we may achieve because we've always got an ambitious program because that's how we achieve funding. And then, and then we look at the statistics later and they may not met, match perhaps the expectation. And that's been the challenge since I have been on council. Uh, and it's been a long, that's been over a long number of years. No one's actually managed to crack it. I thought what Mr. Millwood suggested recently had some merit. So maybe it's worth exploring that with Jeff a little further. Um, in the COVID situation, as has been mentioned, a lot has changed. And, and yes, we may be looking at hearing in a few, certainly a, a bit later on in reporting that we're not matching the expectations we'd like to from the statistic, statistical perspective here. But I think we need to move a bit beyond that. I know our staff are taking it on board. Uh, I think there's a better way of expressing this that may help um, us in terms of justifying those numbers. But I would just like to um, acknowledge the work that is going on in that space. It's a huge, it's a huge work program there. Thank you for what you do. But I also understand the um, sentiments expressed that we need to look at how we're expressing that. Because it, when it comes back and we're not achieving, you know, there is regular concern. I, I don't know how you fix that entirely, unless you have, because uh, we all want an ambitious work program, but it's how you maybe express that that may be worth considering. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say um, I do acknowledge that you have a humongous workload and you do really, really well. And if as councillors, we can help you by making decisions in a more timely fashion so that you can actually get on with your job and not duplicate things, well, then that would be great. Just all I can say is God's bad. Any further speakers? Councillor Mullings. Being, being a new kid on the block, I can't say that I have heard this before. So this is the first time I've, I'm hearing it. But whenever I read this report, I thought to myself, okay, well, gosh, you know, we've just asked you guys to rationalize heavily the, the program of works that you were doing due to COVID-19 and what we've, we've asked you to do to minimize the rates impact. Mm -hmm. So I understand that. And also due to COVID-19, three of the best construction months of the year have also been taken away from us. So we've, we've lost March, April, May. So I also get that. And also some of the things were due to consultation as my colleagues have um, previously brought to mind. I understand that too. Um, whenever you take three months out of the, the schedule as well, we've got 69% here. Um, you know, three months is, is 25% of the year's worth of um, construction. I get that, that makes sense. Um, you are tasked with an impossible Herculean task. Um, so far, so good. I, I do hope that you know, this is an anomaly and I know that you guys have well and truly got the capabilities to do what needs to be done so we can get done what needs to be done. So. Um, I, at, at this point, looking at this and, and the obstacles that you have um, overcome, I take my hat off to you. So, well done. And hopefully we will have a higher batting average next year. <sighs> Thanks. Just an observation, Mr. Mayor. Um, after uh, Ross Mathers died and Councillor Kane joined us, this was her catch beer every year. Um, and quite frankly, I'm not 
too worried uh, about the carryovers. Um, never have been, never will be, they're inevitable. Um, and our staff do the best they possibly can to manage them. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Further speakers? Councillor Atkinson, right of reply. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've heard the speeches of uh, support. There's not one person I don't believe in this room or just about anywhere that actually sits and doesn't support our staff for what they do. What I'm saying is, as our advisors, is that we need to know truthfully what we can achieve and what we can't achieve. Now, that's what we need to know. Sometimes it's tough for us and we say we want this and we want that. The answer is, sorry, I can't deliver it. Very rarely do we get told that. It comes back as, oh, yeah, I think we can fit that in. Well, we need to change this from that, but we can actually achieve it. Asked many times, I've asked it many times myself, so as other councillors, can we get there? Yes, we can. We get to the end of the year, and it hasn't happened. And there may be some reasons around that. We talk about ex extra consultations. We talk about um, the, the, the funding from outside agencies. Our job is to manage that. Our job is to make sure that we get that in line and say, instead of 2022, because we are going to have to do these things, it'll be 2023. Instead of going through and carrying over all the time. Councillor Brown's absolutely right. I've been sitting around this table myself for 19 years. I've listened to it every year. We need to get better at it. And that's what I'm saying. Let's get better. Let's do better at it. We will never get 100% unless we have a program that we can get somewhere near achieving. So if it's a $100 million program, let's budget for 95 million and come back for $5 million deficit funding if we have to, to achieve it. And then all of a sudden you've achieved, shall we say 110% of the program, not 95%. Let's get realistic about what it is we can and can't do. I've seen the screws of paper that uh, uh, Councillor uh, Stewart is talking about. And, and Mr. Young put them in front of us, and I thought, these are great. This looks like we're actually heading somewhere. We actually know where we're going. We had the colours. We had everything in front of us. But here we sit here again in the same situation. And we can use COVID as an excuse if we want to. And But, I mean, if you take 25% of a budget because it's 25% of the year and you move that out, you look at the same thing. We've still got huge carryovers. We need to fix it. Thank you. Um, so we come to uh, the recommendation. I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary. Declare that carried. Thanks, Don, Jared, and Chris. Well, I think it's appropriate time now. We might break for afternoon tea. Um, so if we could be back here about ten to four, please. Can I?
Thank you. So we now move to, um, do you want to deal with 6.1 first or do you want to deal with 8.7, Jared? Sorry. I'm happy to talk to 6.1 and then 8.7 in that order. Since that was the... Um, 6.1, which was the adjourned business, um, pages 26 to 37, the review of the terms of reference for the Land and Water Committee. It's a paper in the name of Sophie, but we've had some technology issues, so Jared's going to talk us through that. Mr Cleary, thank you. Thank you. So this report is uh, coming to you. It should be no, no surprise. This is something that has been talked about for some time. It's really, um, it's actually just a much more efficient way of doing things. Over time, we um, established the Kaipoi River Rehabilitation Working Party and we established the Cam River um, Enhancement Subcommittee. Uh, and then more recently, the council has established the Land and Water Committee. And at the time that it was established, this there was always an undertaking that staff would bring this report back. Um, it's more efficient for staff to be able to service one uh, group, uh, more efficient for the elected members to turn up um, to one meeting and deal with all of the matters that are all related. And also it involves a lot of um, other parties, such as DOC, Environment Canterbury, uh, uh, local iwi. And so from their point of view, it's better for them to have one point to come in. Um, there was a question around... Um, the Cam River uh, Fund. So there are some specific requirements um, in the Environment Court decision. Um, we can still fulfill those obligations um, through this structure. We, um, we actually established the Cam River Working Party in a way to um, keep all those parties involved on board. Um, but what we need to do is whenever we are um, carrying out any works or spending the money, we need to do that in agreement with Fish and Game um, and in cons consultation with the Department of Conservation. So they're the words out of the Environment Court decision. Um, we can uh, still fulfill that in this structure. So happy to take any questions. Thank you, questions. Councillor Blackie. Partially answer my question. Um, with DOC and, and ECAN and such like, I think it says in there somewhere it's the responsibility of the committee members to feed them information. But is it going to be okay either having them or not having them at on assorted land and water committee meetings? Uh, yes, it, yeah, it'd be absolutely fine not having them there. Um, when we are making decisions around the Cam River Fund, then we need to make sure that we have agreement with Fish and Game. So that doesn't necessarily happen at the meeting. Um, and we do need to consult with the Department of Conservation. So we, whether they're at the meeting or we do that through another mechanism is fine. Uh, no, well, the Kaipo River Rehabilitation Working Party doesn't have um, those requirements imposed by the Environment Court. That was a, the reason we established the Kaipo River Working Party was because originally there was a gap nobody was actually taking real responsibility for the river. So it was a way to get Environment Canterbury, the council and other parties around the table. We can still do that through this um, forum. Questions? I've got a recommendation that someone prepared to move. Moved by Councillor Stewart, seconded by Councillor Williams. Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, really happy to um, move this. This is a really common sense. Um, development of bringing all our river environmental type um, uh, particular projects um, into uh, this committee. Um, just to allay uh, our councillors' uh, um, concerns, the, um, the Cam River uh, Fund has in essence been totally allocated pretty much. Um, and Fish and Game was on the um, uh, Enhancement Fund Committee at that point and Department of Conservation actually gave their tick off to the program. Not all of it, of course, in fact, very little of it, little of it been delivered because we were waiting and still waiting, I think, on the consent from ECAN to do these more substantial works. And um, as Chair of Land and Water, I'd be keen that once we did get going again with um, the ability to uh, deliver on these projects that we do actually um, 
at least um, as a matter of courtesy, go back to fish and game and docks so telling them we're underway. But the, the program, the money, as I said, has been allocated to particular projects. We just haven't been able to um, deliver on them because of consent issues. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense, as I said earlier, to bring it all under um, uh, one committee and really keen to see um, delivery of these programs in the next um, wee while. Thank you. Yeah. A few of the speakers, there's nothing to respond to, so I'll put the re recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare it carried. Thank you. We now come to item 8.7 seafoam sampling update, pages 218 to 224, Mr Cleary. Thank you. This report is summarising the testing that was carried out last summer. So we did manage to get some seafoam samples collected um, and tested. So um, you can see the locations uh, on that on the diagram on page 220, which is the A, B, C, and D points. Um, and then the results are summarized um, in section four. It's really, it's important to note there's actually no standards for what um, levels of E. coli or intracoccae you get in C foam. And uh, this is pretty um, experimental, I suppose, um, the work that we're doing. Um, the other important point is, at the time we took the sea foam samples, we also took water samples and, and all, on all occasions, those water samples were below the limits in the, in the seawater. Um, now the reasons you get really high numbers um, in the uh, sea foam when you compare it to water, are uh, the um, bubble scavenging, and replication that occur. So basically the, bubble, the, the bubbles themselves actually just accumulate um, bacteria and then they actually provide, they're like a little greenhouse. So when the foam's sitting on the beach, um, you get the nutrients, you've got nice warmth um, and so they can, uh, you know, bacteria under ideal conditions to rep can replicate every 20 minutes um, and double their number each time. and, and so that growth is very exponential. So you'll see, um, you can, you know, if you look at some of those samples, those numbers might look quite high, but that's not um, an unexpected result to get that in um, this kind of environment. Um, Sophie has had discussions with CPH and Environment Canterbury about these results, um, and they are not recommending any action as a result of these. Um, and particularly given that the water samples are still in compliance. Um, look, we'll uh, continue, we can continue to do this. Um, the, the, uh, mo most of the cost is collection, uh, so we're, and we're managing that with our, within our own staff resources and getting those to the lab um, so that we can continue to uh, monitor it. Uh, over the over the coming summer, but just given we're into winter now, we've put that on hold. So look, um, I'm look, happy to take any questions on this. Uh, Joe, just just given the um, the numbers that are here, and and I mean really hard when you don't know quite what level that number is at, sort of thing. Um, and the fact that they're so high to what they sh they should be on the uh, E. coli, this stuff lies on the beach. What danger you're saying that it get, as it as it heats, it gets exponentially worse. So therefore, the E. coli E. coli gets worse every time. What does that do to people who are walking through it? Uh, to people that are um, uh, animals that are walking through it and so on. I mean, whether it's lying on the beach or I mean, obviously it's not in the water. Get that. This foam is lying on the beach with these high levels of E. coli in them. What, what danger does that pose? Well, there's, I suppose there's a, cu a couple of points. This, this is not the only location in the world where sea foam occurs. So it's a naturally occurring phenomena um, all around everywhere. Um, the, certainly there's no uh, CPH, because Sophie has had this specific conversation, 
they've got no record of people getting sick from sea foam. Um, whether that means no one ever, ever has or they don't, or, or um, when people do get sick from swimming, whether it's just from purely the water or, or foam, I don't know their answers to all of those. And they're really interesting questions and they're extremely hard to, would be extremely hard for us to actually answer that. Um, it's, and, but, but look, there's certainly no evidence that there's a heightened risk because of that to the public in um, this area that you wouldn't necessarily get anywhere else you might see sea foam. And I'm, I'm having trouble understanding how there's no heightened risk. If you've got huge numbers of like E. coli, and as I say, I don't know whether that's in a danger zone or not a danger zone in what we've got, how can that not be a heightened risk if it's up there? And the fact that no one's had it means, what does that actually mean for us? I mean, does it mean, what does it mean? I mean, I mean, you're right, there's sea foam everywhere. I mean, I go to the um, Sunshine Coast and I mean, you have sea foam that's a foot deep, um, you know, two feet deep. Um, but it's certainly nowhere near an ocean outfall and doesn't have E. coli in it. So I, these facts are here about the heightened level. So how do we find out whether that actually means something or not? Well, the, the presence of E. coli or entrococci, is an, they're indicator organisms. So they show that there is life there. Um, it's, there is fr it is from warm-blooded animals. Um, and it has got the ability to, to replicate on its own. So once you get the, you know, those naturally occurring bacteria in the environment. Um, I suppose because we don't have uh, any advice from the CPH to say that they're, they're concerned about the health risk. We really are relying on their expertise in terms of what that public health risk is. You know, to really answer it, this would be, you know, PhD research material for people who are working in public health and the, and, and the envir environment. Um, it's certainly well beyond our ability to be able to do that. You know, our, we're limited in terms of actually being able to go out and record it um, and then talk to the experts about it. Redmond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jared, have we tested the discharge before it's discharged um, of the ocean outfall material? Before it enters the sea, do we know the E. coli levels in, in that? Oh. Yes. Yes, so we've got regular sampling we do uh, on the discharge prior to being disposed of, um, and we sit within our consent limits on all of the parameters. So we've got specific um, requirements that we need to achieve. We report that publicly, including to the council. Um, I'm happy to find the most recent report, and I can send that to you, Councillor Redmond, which gives you a good summary of that. Uh, supplementary question. Are we any closer to knowing the source of the E. coli contamination now? No. And we're saying that's too hard. Um, we've actually tried to do faecal source tracking, which is quite expensive. Um, and we did spend quite a lot of money on that. Um, and we, we just can't get enough in the sample to be able to do that. You need to have large volumes of water with a higher level of um, E. coli or entrococci in it. We just don't, we haven't got the ability to gather samples in those concentrations and needed to give you that result. So um, we, we are not able to advise what that source is bec just because it's not able to be tested. Yeah. Um, are we going to, or do you think it's necessary for us to send a wee letter to um, Michael Bate regards their findings here that um, we've sent the results to the other agencies and um, we've come back with a mutual set of facts, 
certification certification um, result. Well, satisfactory result um, on the, yeah, it is too much coke. Um, you know, on the results, is it worth doing? Yes, happy, happy to do that. We did send off um, a letter relatively recently to um, Michael Bate, um, but look, we can specifically give him one that, that um, references this report, and we'll include a copy of the, the report and also um, hone in on, on that particular point. Any further questions? So we have a recommendation here. So I'm prepared to move. Moved by Councillor Ward, seconded by Councillor Stewart. Councillor Ward, do you wish to speak? Yes, thank you. Um, I, thank you. I just want to say that um, I just really feel that this is not really nothing to worry about. I've seen lots of seafoam um, on the west coast, uh, which is much, much greater. This it usually happens with um, in a, in uh, a storm situation, and I've seen it happen in Sydney. I've seen it happen everywhere. I'm quite happy about the E. coli. I think if you probably tested some of the ground around where it sits, it's, you'll probably get the same result. So, um, uh, and I'm happy with this report. And I, I don't think we need to um, take it too much further. And I'm happy that you're doing it within the, the same working people that you've got. Thank you. So Stuart. Thank you. Um, this has been a long running saga to come to this conclusion. And I do welcome um, this conclusion. It has cost the council quite a lot of money. Um, and I, um, I'm not um, uh, criticizing that at all. Um, though it has got to a point now where we're actually pioneering science here and whether um, uh, there has been an assumption um, from members of the public that the, the E. coli or enterococci in the seafoam sample comes from our, a malfunctioning um, uh, sewage treatment plant. That's actually not the case. We meet our consent on every level. So I think that message needs to clearly go out there. It could be uh, that um, we've got a, um, a poopy beach from the fact that there are seabirds um, letting their um, internals go um, uh, and being washed in uh, to, the, to the shore, um, people's dogs, the whole deal. Um, and as Jared has said, a very difficult and very expensive um, to um, do some fecal source tracking. In fact, we, we as he said, attempted it massive volumes needed to um, have anything that would be scientifically um, uh, significant and we're just unable to do that sort of um, uh, study. So I think I would agree uh, we've, we've done our best to, um, to determine whether there is a public health risk um, and I am quite comfortable um, with the fact that um, our public health uh, organised authorities are comfortable with where we're at here. Um, Sophie was able to look through the, the data internationally and, and find that there'd only been one or two studies in Japan where seafoam had been um, uh, studied. So we are actually pioneering work here and I think um, uh, it is time to put uh, this investigation to rest, though I agree with Jared if um, if people if staff are out there sampling um, for our consent and there is a whole whack of sea foam, then certainly um, have another go at it. But um, as he's described, the foam X is a, a group with where we're at in the recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Stewart. Councillor Atkinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Look, I'm not going to not support this, but I'm not comfortable with where we're at. No one seems to know anything about everything that we've got. <laughs> and um, the most sensible suggestion or 
maybe not a suggestion, but a PhD student may be able to actually take this on and do a thesis and find out what it's like. We're not talking about normal sea foam here. Look, I've travelled around Australia, I've travelled around New Zealand, there's sea foam on every beach. We're talking about scum that is in the sea foam on our beach. We don't know whether it's come from Christchurch, we don't know what it's from, we don't know where it is. We, we haven't done that, we just don't know. So what we don't know, we don't know, but it'd be kind of nice to find out. And if that's, I mean, we've done what we can do. I, I, I get that as, a, as budgets allow us to do that, but we really need to know what, what this is all about. I mean, it's not on every beach. I've seen sea foam right around the country and it doesn't look like the sea foam that's on our beach. It's not brown and horrible and gross stuff as, as the day goes on and leaves scum lines right across the um, uh, the beach line at the, the tide marks. I mean, you guys have all seen the photos that, that have come here on it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't happen in other places. The sea foam comes and it goes, comes and it goes, disappears altogether. But the actual scum lines in this and the, and the brown, horrible stuff that's in it, it lies to me in my head with some real questions. And especially when you're talking about exponentially growing E. coli in it, in, in the sun and the temperature and, you know, all of those sorts of things. So I would like to know more. I think as a council, we've done what we can do. It took us far too long to do it, in my view, but we've done it. I, I actually think that I'd like to see someone like a PhD student you know, to do a PhD thesis on what it is, if we could encourage someone to do it. And uh, that might be a, a, something this council could do in the future to actually help and find out some of those things right around the world, because surely someone must need to know what it is that's sitting in some of these beaches. I mean, we just seem to glaze over the top that it's sea foam. It's, it, this is different. It, while it is, sea foam it's what's in that sea foam you don't see it in other places around the world but well, sorry around the world i'm not that world um <laughs> around australia and our country it's not there it's just normal sea foam that comes and goes with the tide but that's not what we have on our beach uh, thank you i'd like to endorse councillor atkinson's comments um just turning to recommendation c on page 219, um, my, my main concern is that we have guidelines for E. coli in seawater, but we don't have them in sea foam. And as we've discovered, the levels in sea foam can be much higher. And it's a wee bit of a cop out, I think, to say that um, the recreational water quality guidelines do not apply to sea foam, therefore there is no exceedance of a trigger level and no action is required. So it, it's not for us to set those guidelines, but I would like to think that we may approach Environment Canterbury and public health um, with a view to establishing guidelines. Um, because just to say, well, there are no guidelines, so there's no problem, that, that to me doesn't solve the issue. There, there does appear to be an issue, and we're sort of pussyfooting around trying to find the, the source of it. And I must admit, I'm none the wiser, <laughs> to, to be fair. But um, I would like to encourage the council to see if Environment Canterbury and Public Health would consider guidelines for uh, sea foam. Um, it may even be that they're the same as the uh, water quality guidelines. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. But otherwise, I'm supportive of the uh, recommendations. Councillor Bryan. Thank you. I was uh, first taken white baiting when I was nine months old at the Ashley uh, River Mouth. And I made these comments when this issue was first uh, raised, and we've since spent an awful lot of money. Um, this has occurred for years, for years and years, it's, and it's on again, off again. You know, you might see it perhaps two, three times a, a, a year. You might see it once during the white bait season and it, and it clogs up on your screens and you've got to wash it off when you get back to the batch. It's been happening for years and years and years. But, I, you know, I'd love a, a, a student to do a, th a thesis on how it occurs, but I'm quite sure it's naturally occurring. Um, and, uh, and that would answer any questions, but I'm very opposed uh, to any suggestion that uh, we spend any more money on it. Um, let alone ask Environment Canterbury uh, to spend any money on it. 
Further speakers, Councillor, sorry, yes, Kirsten. Um, I, I think when we consider this report, we've always got to consider two questions. And the first question is, is the ocean outfall having some cause for this seafoam? There's been no scientific evidence shown to prove, prove that at all. And in fact, the contrary has been proven. Our sampling has shown that everything is within consent limits. So at that point, it becomes really hard because the scientific evidence is telling us this is not the case. The second question is, is the seafoam harmful? And whose responsibility is that? And at that point, the responsibility falls back to the DHB because they, they look after human health. Now, if they have not indicated to us as a council that they expect us to take some action, us or ECAN, take some action to help with human health risk, then we cannot consider that and we should not be spending money on that. We are spending ratepayers' money on an area that's not our responsibility. We have seen cyanobacteria in our lakes. We have seen other algal blooms. I've, I've seen algal blooms up and down the country that cause problems. And it, it's often an organic source. Much as you see organic sources on farms or organic sources in the dog park or organic sources all around the place. We live in a natural world. And that means that we live surrounded by different types of growth, which are not particularly helpful to humans. In this particular case, I come back to the responsibility question. Is our ocean outfall at fault? The evidence says no. Is the seafoam harmful? That's not up for us to debate today. That's up for the DHB to take some measures if it's been proven to be harmful. Further speakers? Uh, right of reply, Councillor Ward. I'm fine, thanks. Right, so we have the recommendation before us. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thank you. So we now move. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Perry. Are you joining Mr. Stevens in for this next report? You are? Yep. Thank you. So we're now at uh, item 8.8 .8, New Zealand Vertical Datum 2016 adoption. Mr. Stevenson, uh, it's a report in the name of Mr. Stevenson, Mr. Simpson. Pages 225 to 299. So um, are you taking the lead on this, Mr. Stevenson? So it's just one speaker at a time with us. So why don't you finish, click off accordingly. So Vanessa's listening in the background, she can hear that too. <laughs> All good. Thanks, Mayor Gordon. Um, thank you, councillors. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Not usually a quiet speaker. So. <laughs> this report seeks your approval for uh, the adoption of the New Zealand Vertical Datum 2016. So hopefully the reading wasn't too too dry. Uh, Council currently uses Littleton Vertical Datum 1937. Okay, we've used this for many years. It's uh, taken from the tide gauge in Littleton, and how the marks and survey marks throughout the district are. Uh, leveled is, is from that mark throughout by um, by leveling. It's a very expensive uh, way of keeping marks up to date. Nowadays we've got GPS and the like, and uh, that's where a lot of this NZVD stuff is coming into fruition. Linz has uh, approached all councils across the country and has asked that they look to adopt New Zealand Vertical Data in 2016. It, it is the current um, standard for vertical datums within the country, and there's a lot of benefits in, in adopting it. We've also been approached by other firms to look at adopting it, and I've seen plans come in even for our own stadium here that has been an NZVD 2016. So it, it is being uh, utilised by a lot of firms across the country already, although you know we expect to see it in our Littleton vertical datum 1937 uh, normally. An adoption of NZBD uh, would see us updating the district plan and also the engineering code of practice, utilising it as as per as per 4.3 of this report, and would then also 
uh, bring it to the attention of all external consultants that either work for or work for developers and others throughout the district and in Christchurch City as well. Um, we're not alone. Uh, Selwyn and Christchurch City Council have committed to adopt NZVD. Uh, Selwyn uh, soon, but Christchurch City, they haven't exactly said when they'll adopt it, but they have said that they will adopt it. So that's, that's good news. And across the country, there's been many that already have adopted NZVD. Essentially, staff think it's a, a good way forward and it will give us some certainty on, on datums uh, from now on into the future and it will align with Linz's um, mandate in a way, but also any data that we're getting from them in terms of LIDAR and things like that as well. So I think it's, uh, it's a good way forward. So yeah, look, um, open to questions. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Any questions, Councillor Stewart? Uh, thank you. If in fact um, it is intimately sort of adopted throughout the country, um, which you're indicating everyone presumably will work towards adopting it, or is it up to individual councils to say yay or nay? What does that mean um, for um, plans that may be done from a consultant in, a, in an area where they're on a different datum than, than is here? I mean, uh, oh, sorry. So I think there's, uh, there's, I think there's 13 different regional datums across the country. And if you're doing work in, in that part of the country, then you're doing it to that datum. So if you're working in the Waimaka area or even partially over the West Coast in Christchurch and South Canterbury, you're working to the Littleton vertical datum. So that would be consistent. Uh, if Basically from 1st July, there will be some work in progress where they'll be using the Littleton vertical data. We'd still accept that because we can still transform that data. But then say this time next year, someone presents us with something like that, we'd say, hey, look, you need to give it to us in NZVD, please. Yeah, because otherwise we're having to do some work to, to make it right. But yeah, it is regionally specific. By going across the country, these 13 vertical datums will be uh, abolished over time. And that's that's what Linz wants to see, which is really, it's quite a good thing. So I've got a meeting with an architect on, uh, on Thursday evening for a build that I'm gonna do out at Waikuku next year. Do, do people know that there's, if we adopt it, it's changing and what they need to do, blah, blah, blah? Certainly, that'll be my task to make sure they do know and get that as disseminated as far and widely as possible. Uh, there'll be firms in town and town architecture firms that uh, look, I, I probably won't pick up all of them, but I will pick up the major consultants that do work out here and architects that do work out here because we'll also let our building department, they'll go to their contacts and known consultants to make sure that they're advised as well. So, yeah, it's quite an, yeah, it is a big. Big job, but it is just a contact list and, and an email that goes out with some information fact sheets. So, yeah. Questions? Councillor um, Barnett, followed by Councillor Redman. Uh, just questioning whether you've talked to the district plan team and whether there's any impacts for our district plan review <coughs> going forward. Yeah, so, certainly aware. And I guess it's, it's quite weird, but in our district plan, we have different terms as well, like AMSL, average mean sea level. I don't quite know what that means, but I have to relate that back to Littleton 1937. So just tidying up all of that stuff as well to get it into a consistent format going forward. That's the, that's the key. So yeah, once this goes out, it'll be, yeah, it'll be consistent. Supplementary to that, just wondering about the pre-notification, post-notification impacts is there likely to be many impacts on uh, development in the in the district with the changing of levels so there, there are developments underway that are working to a uh, a datum that they've had since the start okay uh, i can give some examples like west park or windsor park where uh we'd adopted 
Littleton vertical date in 1937, but we put the January 2018. They actually updated all of their as built to the new datum, but there are others that have been so long in, in progress uh, that, that they just haven't. And we just need to be sure of the date stamp on that time, because we can, we can work from an older datum and convert it to a new one, but we've got to have that date as to when it happened. So, yeah, and that, that's, that's the same with uh, any capital works or renewals drawings that we've got. As long as we've got that date stamp, we know when that was uh, the moment in time that that was set. Councillor Redmond. Uh, thank you. The Littleton datum appears to be about 83 years old and a lot of things relate and it is coming to a question, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> a, a lot of historical things relate to um, calibration in Littleton. The Littleton time ball um, was designed to help ships calibrate their navigational equipment. Um, is it, and I mean, things move on over time. Are, are there any downsides to adopting this new standard? Oh, sorry. The only downsides that I can see is that there's a little bit of work to get conversion of all of our existing data, but that can be quite easily done. I, I look, yeah, I can't think of any, but I look to the positives and I look at all the marks that we've got in NZVD throughout the uh, district. There's over 400 versus like 180 for LVD. So it's going to make it easier for builders and uh, surveyors to to uh, survey finished floor levels or, or surfaces or, or new assets and infrastructure. I, I think there's going to be more marks that they can choose from in order to, I would say, clo close the loop when they're doing the works. But yeah, there is certainly a lot of history to uh, LVD. In fact, I got called up last year by Elliot and a senior surveyor from Elliot Sinclair, and he's been he's been mapping it for his career. And uh, but he was a proponent of us going to NZBD as well. He says, "Look, uh, LVD just is it's not even true now to, to what it was. You know, it goes up and down. You know, obviously with tidal patterns and things and mapping." He said, "Look, we're better to go to the to the geoid or the you know the satellite system." So yeah, so. In terms of negatives, some money up front now, but it's going to save us a lot of money anyway going forward. And yeah, I can't, I can't see any other negatives. Okay. okay. Councillor Williams has indicated he's prepared to move, seconded by Councillor Bryan. Councillor Williams. Yeah, I think it's a modern way of moving forward and um, as a long term, we're going to be savings on it. It's probably sounds to me like it's going to be a bit more accurate. So um, we'll move. Thank you. Yep. Any further speakers? Yep. Councillor Redmond. Uh, just one item, Mr Mayor. I take it this report was originally prepared for the UNR committee. So we may like to change reference to that committee, to the council. Recommendation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't in the report that I'm looking at. Thank you. Um, sorry, right of reply, Councillor Williams. With that, I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Contrary to clear at carriage. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson and Mr. Cleary. Adrian, it doesn't matter, I'm not worried about it. My 
Yeah. Well, I've just, yeah, I've just got yours on up there, you see, so, but my, I can't even get into it at all. So it won't even let me in. That's all right. As long as it's got my nose, that's a little windy here, it's just sitting there, that's all right. Mm. Well, I'm not even on Zoom now. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> well, it's not here. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm, I'm not even on it at all. Okay. Yeah, well, just my name is, but not, nothing more. Just no picture. Okay, so we'll all right, order everyone. Thank you. Um, we come back, we come now to item 8.9, which is the implementation plan for the town entrance strategy. We have with us um, Vanessa Thompson and Don Young. Vanessa, are you taking the lead on this? Don. So pages 300 to 329, Mr. Young. Thank you, Ms. Mayor and councillors. Um, I got involved in this project when we, when we were working our way through the various roading projects that needed to be thought about and advanced for this coming year. And uh, it became clear that this project in particular has uh, far more complexities than it first would meet the eye. It's, uh, it really does have an awful lot of uh, stakeholders and different groups who are interested and involved in, in sorting through uh, solutions here. So I organised a meeting with uh, the various internal groups of which there are three departments involved there, uh, including Vanessa, who had been doing quite a bit of work in this space uh, previously. And what became apparent at that very first meeting is that with issues like this, um, there is the risk, and in particular it had been highlighted that with this one, there was the risk that staff could progress issues like this quite a long way, and that that in potentially led to quite a bit of confusion when we got to the end of it, in terms of the council's actual willingness to fund what the community were discussing and agreeing to. Uh, and so there is an awful lot of work with these. There are 20 different sites uh, for just for uh, town towns, which you would describe as an entrance. Uh, and of those, there are a number of different groups in, in each of them. So you, you could pick any one of those town entrances and, and it would be a reasonable project in itself to advance through to a point where you had a design and a costing uh, and were prepared to come to the council and say, this is what we want to build here. And the punchline a little bit was that we felt it would be better to get, it, it is a little bit chicken in the egg, you as the council may well say, well, we're not prepared to say what we want to fund until you've come back to us with some ideas. But on the counter to that, if you give us an idea of, your, of, of the intention of funding, then it assists with those conversations with our community and ensures the expectations are, um, are matched right from the start. Um, now, we as staff have... I won't quite say picked a number out of the year, but it is a little bit of a random number of $50,000 a year, which is intended to be effectively a top up for three or four sites that there is already work happening at. Um, to do a little bit more than otherwise would happen if there was no specific budget to ensure that a town entrance uh, type outcome was achieved. Uh, so this particular paper 
asks that you give an indication to the community for when we begin our conversations, knowing, of course, that that community in turn will have a, hold a view on that and may well feel inclined to come back to you at the time that the LTP is then uh, pulled together and express to you whether they see this as an appropriate level of funding. But it starts the ball rolling in terms of that two-way conversation between the council in a, wearing its funding hat and the community. And I'd put the community boards in that camp and the community in terms of what they would like to see uh, and when they would expect to have it built. We then also moved on to uh, the settlements. And again, there's another reasonable task to identify uh, the, the, the treatment at the outskirts of the settlements. The work that Vanessa has done has moved us a long way towards that in that we have firstly identified what are the settlements and then generally had conversations about the level that you could expect the entrance of a settlement, which is relatively low level. It's, it's, it's really not much more than uh, some bulbous curbs and planting and a bit of signage. So those expectations have already been discussed and accepted, but this report does go one step further by suggesting that until we get a clearer idea of uh, what we are doing and what the council does wish to spend, then let's concentrate on the town entrances and put the lid on the settlement entrances, apart from those instances where Again, work may emerge that meant, look, we're, we're on site anyway, let's just finish this off. So that gives a little bit of an explanation about why this report is here and why it is here very early in the process, which has still got a long way to go in terms of deciding what are we going to do at each of our town entrances. I'm not sure if there's anything more you want to add. Yeah. Um, no. Is that the settlements phase two? We're hoping to bring back to the audit and risk committee in the next couple of months for adoption. So that's not too far away at the moment. It's just being reviewed by staff, um, and then I'll just edit it and then hopefully flick it through to um, the ANI committee soon. Yep, that's all. Thank you. Questions, Councillor Atkinson, followed by Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought you might have a fun a bit of fun putting this together. <laughs> it's never an easy one, this one. Um, a couple of questions, actually. First one is settlements. It's my understanding that uh, NZTA put road signs up for settlements and that they are already there. Why would we go further than that? So that's, that's that question. And then around number two, is more around funding. I mean, I, I don't actually have a problem too much with what's in front of us as we're heading, but the, the second one comes to input from towns and, and what sort of spurred my interest in this was the, the photo you had in there, Vanessa, of, um, of the Kaipui entrance sign, which in fact is not the Kaipui entrance sign, it belongs to the Rotary. So around, um, around funding, are we in this investigation as we go further going to go to the Rotaries, the, the Lions, the, um, uh, the community boards with their, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, discretionary funding, all of those people to bolster that funding and, and put in entrance signs? Is that the sort of discussion that's going to go on? Is that where we need to be? I mean, you could, council put 50,000, you could come up with 50,000 worth of public money. Um, for certain towns. So just, is that where we're heading with this? Um, I guess it's something we can certainly consider and that will probably come out in part of the community consultation phase. So looking at Kaipo as an example, if the community indicated that particular sign in the south um, entrance on Main North Road that they wanted to bolster or do a bit more around, then, they, then we'd probably approach Rotary and see if there's some additional funding we can add to the pool. I guess we just have to take that on a case by case scenario and look at what signs we're treating and what other opportunities are available around those. Um, yes, the settlements. Yes, yes, the settlements in terms of signs, I guess once again we'd need to look at that. Um, I know we just did one recently I think for Waikuku Beach where the community helped design that sign so there may still be a desire from the community's point of view to actually design their own signs for their settlements because as you know the NZTA ones are quite um, bare. Um, so I guess that once again would come out as part of that consultation. If there was a desire, we would travel down that path. If not, 
we would maybe look at that, um, putting that additional money into more landscaping or some other treatment. Oh, okay. It's just clarification, really. So the existing signage that is throughout the, the district, that is um, uh, to be worked on and gone back to the community to see if they're satisfied with that. Yeah, because I mean, you've got, as, as Councillor Atkinson said, that's the rotary sign. The actual Kaipo sign, which was 45 green, is the one near the Kaikanui with the flowers growing on it, over it that you can't actually read when you're coming into um, Kaipo. But I, I'm, yes. Yes, which was, and Vanessa nodded, is this basically stay, what's already there, you go back to your community and say, do you want more than this or are you quite happy with what we've got? I guess we can adjust what's there or we can just put new um, new signs in. So I think what we did is identify entrances where they could do with some enhancements or beautification. Some of those may have signs or, or stuff in place infrastructure already that we can potentially enhance or replace items. Some of those entrance areas have nothing. So it's a case of do we want to put additional signs there? Is that something the community wants to support? Um, and that's what we would explore through that community consultation process essentially. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah, I'm just concerned with uh, we're making a rod for our back for doing this because um, Lowburn is not mentioned in this report. Pegasus is not mentioned in this report. Burnside, Swan and O, are they all going to come on the bandwagon when they read this, wanting money for their um, settlements as well? Um, I'd imagine um, the Lowburn people. Yeah, this is a question. It's, uh, the Lowburn people will think theirs is a nice settlement that's probably um, well advanced. So, As I mentioned earlier, we're going to bring back the phase two settlements in a couple of months and you'll see some of those small um, settlements will be listed in that document in terms of how we treat them. So we, we originally picked the towns for the phase one towns. We chose them because they were listed in the DDS, District Development Strategy. So we've taken a similar approach with the settlements and picked the settlements out of the DDS that were listed in that. But of course, that's open for discussion. So once that document comes forward, if these additional settlements that we haven't mentioned that you feel or the community boards feel need to be included, we will of course consider that as staff. Pegasus is actually mentioned in phase one towns, but we decided not to treat, um, we had looked at the main entrance in as well as Bob, Bob Robertson Drive and decided um, the main entrance didn't actually need additional enhancements because it was looking lovely with the signs and stuff. Bob Robertson Drive at the time, we were going to probably come back and review it once um, Ravenswood had developed a bit more, and then we we're going to consider that again. But yeah, so we'll, we'll come back to you on those settlements, and you'll see them in phase two. Yes, yes thank you. I, I, I guess my perception is, to use your terminology, Council Williams, the, the rod for your back is, is actually the strategy in, in terms of we are consulting with the community about what they would like. And that process has already begun and is underway. So the intention of this is, is to put a bucket, bucket around or a box around that rod to say, whatever you guys come up with out there, we're only gonna put this much in for the meantime. And I 100% agree with Councillor Stewart's comments that will then lead the community itself to decide what do we want to do then and can we get other money from other sources? So this is intended, I suppose, to, to limit your exposure, if, if, if you agree to this, while this consultation will still occur and there will be expectations out there as, that, that are already in place because of our other work in terms of st strategy. This report won't escalate that. It'll, it'll do the opposite, I'm hoping. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of chicken and egg a bit, isn't it? If we go back to the community boards, whether we're talking new stuff or upgrading, what, is, is there not a strong inference there that, that whatever they decide, we're, we're going to allow the budget, which is a, for it, at a council level, which is actually a separate issue to whatever they decide to do. Is, is that, are you okay with that? I 100% agree, and we did think about whether this was indeed the right thing to be doing. We are sending a signal to your community out there 
that, that this is the importance, if that's the right word, this is the, the importance you put on this particular issue. Um, we, I think we ended up concluding that was a good message to send them, even though it's a little bit of a hard message, this early in the process. Um, because in Vanessa in particular was indicating quite a strong risk that we could well be spending the next five or six months consulting with people. And the next you see is some very fine plans that are all being drawn up and they look lovely uh, and everybody has an expectation. And the next you say is, sorry, we're not going to fund that for the next three or four years. And everybody ends up disappointed with the uh, outcome. This is hoping to match that expectation right from the start. Yeah, Don's explained a fair bit of that, I think. But I mean, the basic question I've got, are we going to eat up this 50,000 for the next three years just in their own bureaucracy of getting to the end of the story? because it costs an awful lot to actually get the plans up there and find out what it is that people want. So I'm wondering if the 50,000 is actually going to get us to the plan per year or, and then we're going to do the funding of the, we'll call them gates for whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, have we, are we really managing any expectations? It is a very good comment and that Vanessa has pointed out she's effectively working for free on this particular project and that she has many projects which don't get funded specifically against the accounts she's working on. And, and Simon in particular was quite keen to see if you could hand this off to another staff member <laughs> who could bill time against a specific project. We internally have not yet had that conversation about where internal costs will lie. Um, if it does turn into something that internal costs were needing to be sheeted home, you've got a very fair point about this. This money won't all be for the physical works because some of it will have been used up elsewhere. Councillor Mailings. Um, with regard to the the urban entrances, you know, that, that makes sense to me because those are more clearly delineated, but what strategy have you got to delineate the settlements? I see that that's your stage two, but, but just from my own experience with the Ahoka Residents Association, um, we, as, a, as an association, um, designed and, and, and worked with council to um, implement the installation of those settlement signs, but you wouldn't believe the debate of where the entrance to Ohoka was and where, where it began and where it ended. Where it, yeah, I mean, we actually even lost the secretary because she was deemed not to live in Ohoka. She was upset. <laughs> so, um, and, and I see that you've got us down, um, that, that you've got us down there as um, population 3,195 in the Ahoka Mandeville area. I dare say that you would be very hard pressed to find somebody that would be happy with um, an Ahoka sign up in Mandeville and vice versa. They're, they're, it, it, and, and then you, you, you find a difficulty in, in delineating what's where because in the rural areas, it's not so clear and, and where one, one settlement bleeds into the next. So have, have you got a, I did ask it before. So have, have you got a way to get around that? Otherwise I think that could be a too hard basket. <laughs> we feel we haven't actually looked that far into it yet. <laughs> um, I, I guess it'll be just looking at um, where a congregation of houses are on, on the map. I don't know. It's something, um, yeah, we'll have to explore and come back to you on that one, I think. But thanks for raising it. It's, it's, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Councillor. And we know over time that this is an absolute... Uh, challenge uh, to put it politely to actually get a result in this space and I suppose what this report's trying to signal is um, we actually don't think you should invest too much effort in that unless you're prepared to invest some serious money and is this really the priority for our community at this time and I think the answer we're trying to I think if adopting these recommendations today the answer clearly to our community is uh, for some time, we're not really going to be investing in this with a great deal of effort and energy. And if um, if they and then you want something different to that, then the quantums that we would have to spend in this space are substantial and fraught with challenge. 
trying to get a once you've agreed where the sign should go then what the sign should be um, is equally a challenge and it's um, uh, something we think we've got better energy to invest in and, and my last point was i think the staff will bring this strategy to you on settlements in a couple of months and i think that would be the ideal opportunity for you to the, the staff have a rationale for why they've chosen the nine settlements if you believe it should be a different mix that should come through as a recommendation from you at the time you see that strategy in front of you it's been good questions councillor brian's indicated wants to move seconded is it councillor Reckons? You indicate seconding. Councillor Bryan. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the, all this is doing is putting some money into the draft LTP uh, that in turn uh, will uh, get feedback uh, not only from the community boards but also the general public as to whether 50,000 in the budget is money well spent in the current in, environment. And moving this today is not any indication that I will vote in favour of it next year. Uh, it just gets into the big picture, uh, which is where it needs to be, quite frankly. Look, I agree with Councillor Bryan. Rather interesting, I just, uh, Councillor Bryan and I indicated to each other after Mr. Christensen's report that uh, sort of $160 million went through at the flick of a hat, but we can't decide what we should do with town entrances. So uh, it's rather relevant, really. But uh, I agree that it's going to the right place at the present time. We'll, we'll thrash our way through it there. Put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thanks, Vanessa and Don. Thank you. Okay. Actually, well, we, we'll move along to the next report, which is 8.10, a contribution to local RSA clubs. This is a report in my name. This follows... Uh, the discussion that we had on uh, proposed this on a one of our Zoom calls, so it's just seeking a contribution to our local three local RSA uh, welfare funds in lieu of the ANZAC contribution that the council would normally make to the community by way of health and safety um, uh, uh, work, plus also the reads that we uh, produce and all the support that we give to the local RSAs and the production of it. I had a conversation with BJ Clark, who's the president of um, New Zealand RSA. Uh, they are not planning to do a poppy day this year. Um, and also just to make sure that there was no, uh, you know, where, where the strategy might be at a, at a national level. Um, and I've talked to our local RSAs with the exception of CUST. Um, and Rangura and Kai, in the recommendation, it's got a thousand for each of Rangura and Kaipo. And the reason for that is that they do support more than one service. CUST um, is recommending 500, which uh, because they, they just do CUST West East. And so it was just a contribution. Uh, there seemed to be general agreement when we talked about it on the Zoom course. That's why I brought it forward as a report. Um, happy to answer any questions. Questions? Some are prepared to move. Moved by, oh, oh, oh sorry, question first. <laughs> Councillor Williams. I'm not quite familiar with the, um, uh, Sefton, we go up there for an RSA service and, um, and all those other places, Oxford as well, not mentioned here. Um, I don't know the situation there. Can you give me a bit of um, background on them? Ringura supports both Sefton and Oxford. Um, uh, it, it, that's the way it is. Uh, CUST actually, they, they um, relationships with Christchurch RSA. Kaiapoi supports, it's sort of uh, Kaiapoi and Ahoka. Ahoka is supported alternately by um, both Ringura and Kaiapoi RSA. Tua Hiwi's Kaiapoi. Uh, Woodend is now Kaiapoi. So those look, we were never going to be able to find a perfect solution, but by making a contribution to those RSAs, it uh, was picking up the bulk. Uh, and it's just a contribution. It's never going to be, it's never going to be all the amount that we set aside, which is normally in the order of near twenty thousand dollars. So 
um, this was just a small contribution to those RSAs and, and the welfare support that they, they won't have now the same revenue because they haven't had the poppy day this year. So, okay, so someone prepared to move, Councillor Blackie, seconded by Councillor Atkinson. Councillor Blackie? Councillor Atkinson? Just to echo what you said, you made a very fine debate there, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Doody, did you wish to say anything? The speakers. So I'll put that. Put that. All those in favour, aye. Contrary, declare that carried. Thank you. Um, Matters referred for com uh, from committees and community boards. I have none. Health and sorry. Hold on. Sorry, Jim. There wasn't. Oh, I'm in the right space. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, Health and safety, 10.1, Jim, pages 333 three, three to 346. Take the report as read. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Questions? Councillor Palmer. Sorry, just one question, uh, Mr. Palmer. Just wondering how you're monitoring the health, uh, the, the sort of mental wellbeing of, of our staff during these tricky times. If you could just give us a bit more information on that. So we have a we've had a um, a survey of staff that al allows people to volunteer or voluntarily update at any time, and a part of that question is you know are you okay and do you need any help? The first time we put that out, uh, we had I think mid forties number of staff responded, and one or two signalled that they weren't coping so well. So we uh, supported them to the best of our ability. We've got our both our human resources, health and safety staff and EAP services there to support anybody who's needing that support. We are undertaking a survey at, at the moment, just started it to staff to say what did they find worked well, what didn't, how are they, have they coped? Uh, so to get a little bit of uh, some metrics back around that. Um, other than that, it's anecdotal, anecdotal support and contact, which is intended to happen regularly between supervisors and staff. Bearing in mind the um, high consequences of, of that, would that be included in the next health and safety report? I think we're happy to give you any generalised feedback that we can provide in that space, yes. The questions, some are prepared to move. Your question, Councillor Doody. Um, how does that affect uh, the councillors? Are they included in on this or is it a separate thing altogether or are we exempt from it? So I think that same survey was uh, distributed to councillors and the opportunity to participate. I don't know how many took up, uh, the answers don't come back to me, so I'm not sure how many actually took up that opportunity to comment. Um, okay. I can answer that question anecdotally. I, I haven't talked to Sarah in detail about it, but it, it did, uh, there were a, quite a large number of you actually did respond in from boards as well. There were uh, no major issues expressed through through that that we should be concerned about, but it was an opportunity, and people can submit on that as often as they, or uh, take part in that as often as they like. So, um, but I thought it was a very good exercise and a really good initiative that came through from Liz and the HR team, just to connect with people to see how everyone was doing. So, um, that's that's all there is to update on that at this point. Councillor Doody is prepared to move, seconded by Councillor Barnett. Councillor Doody. That's fine, thank you. Any further speakers? I'll put that. All those in favour, aye. Contrary, declare that carriage. There's no committee minutes for information. Community boards for information. It's mentioned there due to COVID 19, there hasn't, well, there's been Zoom calls, but not formal meetings. 
uh, reports, there's no reports for information. We come to item 14, which is my di the Mayor's diary, item 4.1. It's there, I'm happy to answer any questions. Some are prepared to move. Moved by Councillor Atkinson, seconded by Councillor Ward. Any, any discussion? I'll put that. All those in favour, please say aye. Contrary, declare that carried. So we come to Council portfolio updates. I'm just appreciative in the interest of time. Members could keep these just brief, please. So iwi relationships, just briefly, um, we've got the Mahi Tahi um, coming up, 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 uh, meeting coming up shortly. Um, we've got this, well, I hope there is. Um, I think we're still establishing the, settling the date, but it, um, I've seen a date being circulated. Um, and both the Chief Executive and I have um, kept in touch by Zoom with Tim Myrie, um through this exercise. So that's all I have to update. Is there any questions of me? Canterbury Water uh, Management Strategy, Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, the Major, as you'd be aware, is um, the announcement of the pending um, MPS Fresh Water, which was um, last week with um, implementation uh, in July. So I understand um, it has major implications for us. And I think there'll be an update to the Water Zone Committee on Monday um, at their meeting. Um, I think it's in the agenda. We're just getting it now. Um, so I think we should schedule, if we haven't already got it planned, a, an update to this council um, about um, uh, how, how it affects us and our waterways. The other thing um, is that if it in fact goes um, and is um, adopted, uh, as is indicated by the government, it will certainly need to be given effect to. And in fact, I think we've just got a note come through this afternoon that in fact that is the case. It will need to be given effect to in the TC7 hearings which haven't actually been scheduled at this point um, so it um, it does up the ante considerably for um, uh, what is required under PC7 uh, particularly some things like um, having having uh, water quality improved within a generation um, and nitrate levels um, tailored to that whereas they were going out 60 to of 80, 90 years. Um, as far as I can see, while the government um, has, is reviewing in a year the um, dissolved inorganic nitrate, nitrogen level that was one milligram, it does say in the cabinet papers 2.4 milligrams is where it's heading. Um, that's a major for our, our rivers, Kaipo and Silverstream, which are well over um, at the bottom line at the moment. Um, so there's that to um, deal with, and we'll learn more about it in the next um, few weeks, I suspect. Um, I'm having a meeting on Friday with ECAN's new river engineer, um, Fred Brooks, who's, who's taken over from retired Brian McIndoe. Uh, those of you who go past along the, the river will see the, the ivy getting away up the trees that ECAN takes care of on the Kaipo River. Um, Fred Brooks um, acknowledges that that is not a um, level of service that is acceptable in an urban area. So I'm meeting with him and Chris Brown and a few of um, perhaps Grant McKay are coming along having a talk. So I can report back on where we get to. Where I'd like to get to is that Fred will come along and talk about getting rid of the ivy, they're going to poison it, um, and then a planting program for the whole length of um, the urban area of the Kaipo Riverbanks. Questions of Councillor Stewart? Thank you, Councillor Stewart. International Relationships, Deputy Mayor Atkinson. Anything to, any questions of Councillor Atkinson? Thank you. Um, regeneration, Councillor Becky. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, bridging has fired up again. Um, we had divers down in the river over the weekend. Um, amongst, other, amongst other things, the good news they found was that since the bridging was done last uh, year, 
the river, there is no there is no additional salt, which means that salt, silt, silt, dry silt, which means the river isn't silting up, which was always a worry after our dredging, how fast it would um, regress and we'd have to do it again. So that's so that's fairly good news. Um, we had a meeting, uh, Regian had a meeting on Thursday to discuss the moor swing moorings versus pile moorings and the ownership and the transfer of boats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, Councillor Atkinson very kindly stood in for me because I'd run away to the sounds. So that's, that is an ongoing dialogue. Karaki car park is progressing well. That heap of rubbish vessel from the wharf has gone. Tim Smith has taken it away and we're hallelujah. And uh, roading's proceeding well. Um, Duncan and his team have taken on board the fact that some of that roading may, if well, happen to happen. Uh, some of that roading is, um, is where they don't want to road. So they're within the within the parameters of the contract, they're they're doing minimal things. This is the road to Ashkeaton to the launching ramp. So they're doing their best to keep it. It was always a minimal level of service anyway that road, and they're trying to um, keep it down to as little spend as little money as possible on it. The irrigation of the playing fields is finished; just has to be commissioned. Um, Tiger Turf is working on, uh, starting any day now with the permitting on the um, diamonds and um, Watson Hughes are uh, kicking off on the um, changing rooms at the, um, at the playing fields. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Black. Any questions? Thank you. Councillor Mayling. Sorry, was it a question, Councillor? Yeah, <laughs> Very busy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mayling. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so from the sustainability and climate change point of view. Um, you've all just heard Mike O'Connell's um, lovely report and all of the details are in there for you to read. Um, he is, as he said, working on stage two of the sustainability um, strategy. And um, with regard to climate change, um, there is a an in progress as yet uncompleted inventory on things that we are doing to address climate change. Um, and Veronica Spittle is working on drafting up the climate change policy for council as we speak. And um, I, I would just like to just iterate that COVID-19 has, has shown us um, that the changes that we thought were in the too hard basket and that, that couldn't happen and wouldn't be able to happen quickly. We, we've done all those things. We've, we've shown the leadership that we needed. We have made the changes that we needed for COVID-19. Those are very, very similar to what we need to address climate change and sustainability issues. Let's not learn, let's not lose that lesson. And that's it from me. Thanks guys. Thanks, thanks Nikki. Any questions? Thank you. So I have no questions, no urgent general business. Uh, so that we now come to matters to be considered with the public excluded. There's a recommendation that someone prepared to move.